we ready. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Markowski. Welcome to my studio. Today we are going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists of all time. Today we are going to be looking at Hiroshige, um, one of the greatest Japanese artists of all time, and we're going to paint uh, arguably his most famous and important artwork of all time, the sudden shower over Shin Oshansi Bridge and Atake from the series 100 Famous Views of Edo, uh, or Edo, sorry, um, which is actually, there were 119 views. Uh, he kept going and his uh, followers afterwards continued that uh, project from 1857, which was completed shortly before his death. This is uh, a very, very famous painting or print, I should say, um, most notably because it was one of the favorite artworks of Vincent van Gogh, who subsequently did a version of it in the 1880s that now hangs in the van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. So we're, we're going to look here. In fact, here is van Gogh's version of this very same painting. So our painting, the version we do today, is probably going to be a little bit of a blend between the original print and the Van Gogh. And um, it's, this one is going to take a little bit of time to do. So like some of the more recent ones, it's going to take uh, um, uh, be a little bit more than, than the two hours I, I like to go for. But uh, I think it's going to be worth it because this is such a gorgeous artwork and such an important artwork in art history which bears um, some, which not only influenced a lot of Western artists, but Hiroshige himself was influenced by Western artists. And some of the things that we see in here and the way it was produced, all, you know, it's, this is kind of, I think such a fascinating artwork because it's kind of at the nexus of a whole bunch of major changes in um, geopolitics, uh, the, the, the industrial revolution, global trade, all sorts of things. So there, and there's certainly been lots of stuff written about this. So anyway, let's jump right into it. We're going to um, start by getting the image onto the canvas. I'll show you how to do that and where to find that. I've got a free template for you. Then we're going to stain it. Then we're going to talk about Hiroshige's biography. We might do some underpainting, although I'm probably going to try to paint this fairly thin. So we shouldn't have too much of a trouble seeing the, the lines underneath. And then a background, back, background, foreground, background, foreground, all the way until we do our side by side. And, you know, if I can get this done in three and a half hours, that would be awesome. But uh, there is so much detail, including the rain on top, which poses a bit of a challenge for, for us, depending on which way you want to do it. So the plan here, or that's the plan. This is how you can support the channel if you want to. If you want to support the channel, you can do me a huge favor, like the video right now. And if you continue watching and you don't like it, then you can always pr push like again, and that kind of unlikes the video. <laughs> you could subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell. The vast majority of the people that watch these videos um, and even people who like the videos never subscribe. And you could do me a huge favor just by subscribing. Um, as well, if you want to leave a small donation to the channel, as little as a dollar, 25 cents through PayPal, you could send a check or e-transfer via my email. My email's on my on the Facebook page. I'll show you that in a second. And on my website, those links are below. You can contribute through Super Chat, although YouTube takes 40% of whatever you donate. So, um... Uh, certainly, any any um, any support is is uh, welcome and and uh, graciously accepted, uh, but I think probably some of those other options are or maybe most beneficial. So uh, let's go to our first step here, getting the image onto the canvas. Now, again, we could draw this out. Oh, this is our Facebook group. Join the Facebook group. Upload a photograph of, of what you do today, whether it's Hiroshige's artwork or something else of interest to you um, that's uh this is a super supportive group i think there's like what 830 people on there but every week another 20 or so people join anyway 
this is where there's a Dropbox folder. Click on the link in the description below. It's going to take you to that Dropbox folder. And we scroll down here. Well, I should, I should say at the very top, here's the resources for our, our basic introductory paintings. And then these ones are for, you know, your beginner artist, some uh, inspirations here. Some are a little bit more complex than others. And then these are maybe your, your more intermediate artworks down here. And we go all the way down to Hiroshige right down here. And today is the beginning of a whole month dedicated to uh, Asian Art History Month, or Asian History Month, but for our purposes, Asian Art History Month. Uh, so there'll be a whole bunch more names appearing on there over the next few uh, weeks, um, if you're interested, to, to join us on this incredible journey, taking a look at some artists you may or may not have ever heard of before. Anyway, inside this folder for Hiroshige, you're going to see the original artwork, as well as the outline that I've done. In, um, there's a JPEG version and a PDF, as well as Van Gogh's um, his interpretation of that painting for reference, should you, should you want to look at it. Okay, so there's the original, and here's the outline, which I did on my iPad Pro using the Procreate app. And you can print this, download it from the Dropbox, print it out, and I'm going to show you how to transfer it onto the canvas right now. So, and I see a few questions in there. There's, uh, there's Lolly saying hello. Christine says, hi, everyone. Cool painting. And Mr. L1N says, nice. I love your streaming. Thank you so much, my friend. Christine says, I'm doing the basic drawing course, and I really like them. I'm up to the two-point perspective, and it's really interesting. I have a question though, I find myself sketching rather than drawing. I don't know why, is that a common thing for beginners? Um, that's an interesting question, the, the difference between sketching and drawing. Okay, let me get to that in a second. Um, okay, so to, uh, let me see, I'll just put this back here. Um, so what we're gonna do, to, once we've printed out the outline on just your regular inkjet printer, laser jet printer at home. We're going to transfer it onto a canvas. Now I'm going to use a 9 by 12 sized canvas board and I ordered these off of Amazon. I really like these. They're better, they're, they come up to about $2, $2.50 a piece when you order 20 or so of them at a time. Which is, and I think they're, they're much better than the, the dollar version you get from the dollar store. So uh, but the ones from the dollar store work perfectly fine. I used the ones from the dollar store for the first 40 episodes of our painting series, and we're up to, what, 281 right now? And that's just the episodes. In some of these episodes, I've done, you know, four or five paintings at the same time. Okay, so we tape this down roughly into the middle. And then I'm going to use some carbon transfer paper. Or actually, this is graphite transfer paper that's in the carbon transfer paper folder. Uh, they do, they're different materials, but they do virtually the same thing, or almost essentially identical. So once we've got that down, then I'm going to trace over top of this. This is the far shore mentioned in the title to the piece of which there are these boat houses along here that are almost imperceptible in the actual print and it's interesting because the print prints have a life of their own and the more and more prints you make from a block the more the original starts to deteriorate so in some versions of this you can actually see more detail on that far shore and then some of them it, it just looks like a solid kind of blob back here. So I think for our purpose, we're just going to turn it into a solid blob because otherwise uh, there's enough stuff to keep us busy in this painting as it is. Um, there's also different versions of this artwork that feature more of these men pushing these rafts across the, the river here. Uh, that might have been accidentally excluded. Um, that's one of the thinkings anyway. One of the theories. Now, these figures are also kind of complex, so we're probably going to simplify a lot of stuff 
in this painting. Otherwise, there's going to be a lot of grief <laughs> here. So, and that's okay. You don't have to put every detail into these artworks. I think just sort of getting an approximation is great. And I think just trying is great. Because most people don't try. So, um, I think had Hiroshige been around today and he, he saw whatever it is that you create, I think he'd say, well, thank you so much for um, honoring me by doing your best. Is it different? F for sure. But just like every print itself is also just a little bit different. Despite what a printmaker might want, most printmakers, you know, would shudder at the idea of prints appearing different. <laughs> but the reality is, is that it's very difficult to get identical prints. Even if you're printing digitally, you know, sometimes, like this, my printer here is running out of ink. So it's a little bit spotty in places. Like, for instance, the up here, the, this is the title of the series, um, the 100 Famous Views of Edo. This here is the name of this particular artwork itself, the sudden shower or afternoon rain, uh, depending on how uh, the translation. And this here is the signature of Hiroshige. And, of course, in Japanese... Um, art and literature we're reading from right to left right so it's sort of kind of also going in the order of importance um, because at least traditionally in Japanese and a lot of Asian art the artist themselves was uh, not as celebrated as the the content Right? Unlike in, in the Western world where, um, at least for, since maybe the Renaissance period, where we really, um, uh, you know, um, celebrated the, the individual artist in many places in the world, it wasn't about a single artist achieving some kind of renown or celebrity. It was about carrying on a tradition. And so artists like Hiroshige were among some of the first artists in all of Asia to really be celebrated as great artists in and of themselves. I mean, there certainly we know the names of many great artists from Japan and China to this day. It's not like all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden they, but it, it was, it was more of a, um, I don't know how you, it's such, such a totally different approach. I don't even know how to, how to describe it. Which is one of those things that I love. I love that there's different traditions and histories of art and that there isn't just one straightforward line that there's um, that uh, there's lots of disagreement even as to as to what constitutes art history and who did what first and, and what is best and all that kind of stuff I think history is alive and history changes which sounds kind of funny because you think, you know, the past is the past, but every generation seems to reinterpret the past differently. And uh, for better or worse. Right? Sometimes people go back to history and weaponize it and, and take the words of people who came centuries ago from before us and sort of put new words into their mouths and um, and you know be 
people speak to different generations differently and there's art history is a great example because there's many artists who disappeared for centuries you know that were maybe famous for a period of time and then were forgotten and then somebody finds something curled up in a box in their grandma's attic and then all of a sudden that person comes alive again So all of these, the, the boards here from underneath this bridge could pose a little bit of difficulty for people. So it won't surprise me if I see some people, uh, as they reinterpret this painting, take a few of these out. The only thing I would say is when you do that, just make sure that it's consistent and that, you know, if a line is going up here, it doesn't just disappear. So just sort of follow the structure and it, I'll probably inadvertently <laughs> remove a few of these lines just uh, as I paint. Okay, that's great. And it's actually a little bit darker than I was expecting, but I don't mind that because I think I'm going to paint this fairly thin. Now I'm just checking to make sure I haven't missed anything. Now, obviously, I'm not, I haven't done the rain yet, but that's going to be on top of everything else. Um, I'm just going to take my carbon paper. And continue these lines. Okay, that way it goes right. Now, the original has a border, and the way that Van Gogh himself painted this also has a border. So you could add a border onto this painting if you like. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'll do that. I, I wasn't planning on it, but maybe if I really goof it up, I'll decide to do that. Okay. Wow, look at the chat. My God. Goodness. Um, uh, Lama AJ says, what type of paper is this? I just printed the, the template, the outline out onto an inkjet printer. You can download the template from the Dropbox below. Um, and then I'm just painting on a canvas board here. Oh, there's a lolly. Great, thanks a lolly. You're great at answering all these questions for Christine's um, questions here about, do I, am I, I find myself sketching rather than drawing. I don't know why. Um, that's a good question. You know, that is probably something you'd get a lot of argument from artists about. What is the difference between drawing and sketching? Uh, and um, I guess sketching tends to be seen as a, and I think maybe even the way you're using it as maybe a lower form of drawing or as part of the initial starting of a drawing process or the ideation process, the idea of making a quick sketch 
right? Or a, or a thumbnail sketch, as opposed to a drawing which might be seen more like a, a finished artwork, right? People tend to say, like, you could buy it, you know, I'm going to frame this drawing, maybe less so I'm going to frame this sketch. The sketch might be just something that stays in a sketchbook. Um, so, I, I, however, have a great deal of appreciation for the sketch. I think sketches are, you know, uh, there's something raw and powerful about a sketch that is kind of the closest we might ever get to, to the to the artist themselves, the artist trying to work out an idea and express it um, without maybe all of the the ornamentation that comes later on. Um, so, you know, it might be the, the difference between, you know, your finished song that you hear on the radio versus the, uh, the artist sitting down trying to work out the, the, the rhythm and maybe the lyrics are, are just kind of mumbled or um, there, there's just an improvised um, uh, attempt just to fill in the space before they continue moving on. So uh, I say that just because I, I, I think, you know, I see what you're, you're talking about here being kind of the sketch being something that you're not happy with. Uh, sometimes people, and again, also people think of like sketching as kind of a bit more of a hesitant line. You know, that when people are sketching, they're often doing these types of, 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 of lines, trying to kind of figure out how things go, right? And you're just like, okay, this is going to be a happy face, right? Uh, as opposed to, I don't know, is, is a drawing more like that, where we're a little bit more certain, more confident lines? I don't know. Uh, I think, you know, Lolly was mentioning there in the chat that often people might draw lightly and to try to figure out things, and then once they've got an idea of exactly what they want, they might go over the lines in just the way, you know, that works, uh, but I wouldn't be so hard on yourself about uh, about the way that you're approaching drawing, and I wouldn't put any sort of judgment uh, against the work that you've made thus far, and, and uh, um, because there's lots of like the the quote unquote sketches of Rembrandt, I think are just as good as the paintings he spent months longer working on. Um, uh, you know, the, we should be so lucky to do sketches as well as Leonardo da Vinci and the sketches that he did in his sketchbook. I think if, boy, oh boy, if I could do that, that'd be, that would be, you know, if a little genie came by and, and gave me three wishes, probably three of them would be sketch as good as da Vinci, sketch as good as, as, uh, Van Gogh and maybe sketch as good as, um, uh, who would be another artist I'd love to... Rembrandt would be great. Um, as Tom Thompson, the artist that I'm doing a graphic novel on. So, I think um, there, there's a lot of room there, and I wouldn't be so hung up on... You know, you just get, you'll get better and better as you go. And I think also, one of the things that separate... I, I was... I was having some, responding to some comments last night, um, somewhere on YouTube, uh, about, uh, how, you know, someone was talking about a fear of making mistakes, and I was saying, what defines an artist is the way that we each make mistakes. I think that's what essentially style is. Style is how we deviate from some sort of imaginary concept of perfection. And the way that artists kind of deviate from that, which some people might consider to be mistakes, is that individual personality coming out. So the, the way that you draw, and if the way that you draw is kind of sketchy, that might just be your personality. That might just be your style. And the more that one tries to kind of crush that 
and prevent that from coming through, I think is would be really tragic. I think it's then you're trying to, to be someone and do something that isn't true to your own self. Anyway, I digress. Uh, I hope that is um, is helpful. Yeah, maybe a little bit hesitant and timid at times, but you know, same. I'm I'm the same way sometimes, right? Sometimes I start a drawing with maybe less confidence, and then that just needs to get going. And then it, you know, there's a little bit. Every drawing is a bit of a, is a negotiation, trying to kind of, you know, wrestle something out of the ether, out of your imagination, onto a page, and it doesn't. It never comes easy to anybody, no matter what you may have heard throughout art history or because artists like to give you the impression it comes easy because then you're then you think wow that person must be a genius wow then that must mean their art is worth a lot so then i'm going to pay an outrageous sum for this thing that clearly i can't do myself right um it's the same reason you go and pay two hundred dollars for a lavish dinner at a great restaurant when you could probably, if you spent some time learning those techniques, make it at home yourself. There's nothing, you know, it's not like they're using any materials that you can't buy yourself, right? Yeah, it might not come overnight, but it takes some time. Christine says, I want to learn how to draw trees. Should I copy someone who draws trees or reference nature? Um, I think you should do both. That's how artists learn. That's what we're doing here. We're studying from the masters, but also trying your best to draw from nature is also going to help you develop your own unique vision, right? So then you start looking at your drawings, look at other artists, and then kind of see what the difference is. Do you like what somebody else is doing so much so that you want to kind of replicate that style? Or do you kind of start finding, falling in love with what you've created? Okay. So, let's continue on here. Okay, so our next technique is to is what's called the imprimatur. We want to stain the canvas with a little bit of color. Now, obviously, this is a print that we're recreating here with acrylic paint on canvas. So, you know, we're already off the map here. You know, we're, we're already charting into totally different territory and these are some of the same sort of things that Van Gogh himself would have thought about when he was recreating this because he's you know Van Gogh was a great drawer uh, but clearly decided rather than do a drawing of the same painting he was going to of this print he was going to do a painting of it so um, there's lots of different ways that we can approach this next step and, and I'll just sort of make mention right at the top here what we're going to do is we're going to use seven tubes of paint uh, I don't generally use black, although we can mix it, and there's your recipe there in the bottom. So we're going to use two yellows, two reds, two blues, and what's called a split primary palette. And these are the paints I'm about to use here. This is the brand, although I'm not sponsored, paid by them. No one's given me a, a penny's worth of free supplies at any time over the past three years, even though there have been offers. Um, I want to... Um, this, I just really like this particular paint. I think it works really well for our purpose. So what I've just squeezed out here is some Azo Yellow Deep. And this is considered to be a warm color. So a warm yellow in opposition to or complement or complements our cool yellow. So every color has a temperature. And um, if you don't have Amsterdam paint, you don't want to use Amsterdam paint, you've got some paint already, maybe you've got golden paint. This is more expensive paint, uh, and it is higher quality, although if you're just beginning, you probably won't notice any difference. There are some Liquitex you could use. You could use Windsor & Newton. You could use Artist Loft from Michael's Art Supply. You could use Buzz, Peebo, although I'm not so happy with Peebo lately, so... If you don't rush out and buy Peebo, because they, they do something that is going to come back here in a moment. Holbein, Dyler Rowney, Fevacryl, also a little bit on the cheaper side, um, not quite as good. Nova Color's great, and Chroma Color's great. I just got a whole set from Chroma Color that I want to start trying out soon. 
Uh, but Museum Color in Toronto does exactly what I think Peebo's doing, is mixing in a lot of this titanium white into their paint, and that makes it impossible to make a gray, as I will be using later on, or gray, or, or it only makes a gray, it won't let you mix a black, is what I, I meant to say. So, I'm going to take my paint, I'm just going to squeeze a little bit of each color out on here. You always see I put about as much paint on my palette as toothpaste on my toothbrush, because I don't want to put too much more paint than this on here, because if I do, sometimes it goes to waste, and sometimes I don't use it, or it's going to end as well, it starts drying up the instant you put it onto the, onto the canvas. So if you're constantly putting big blobs of paint all over the place, then I think you're, um, you're, you're wasting paint and you're probably painting with paint that's too, um, that's starting to get kind of seize up and gets kind of sticky and toothpastey like, and that can be super frustrating. Okay, so now I'm gonna take this warm yellow And I've put, you know, maybe 40% water here. This is the only time I ever use water when I'm painting with acrylic paint. Although you can do whatever you like to do. Uh, it's just not really recommended because um, just think when acrylic paint is, is water soluble and it contains water. And so it should already be quite fluid um, as well as Water is how we clean the paint off of our brushes. Acrylic paint is essentially similar in composition to white glue with pigment mixed into it. So, you know, you figure the more um, water you put into your glue, the less, the, the, the less binding power that glue has. Um, but the reason I'm using it here is because right now I'm just basically painting directly, I'm painting directly onto the gesso, and gesso is, uh, has a, a high concentration of basically plaster, and plaster absorbs water very well. In fact, that's how, you know, artists painted the, you know, Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel, by painting directly onto wet plaster. All right, once it, it dries, it absorbs that water, or as it dries, it absorbs the water really well and creates a permanent bond. So again, this is just kind of using ancient techniques. Tried and tested and true. I also hope my voice lasts throughout here. I wasn't feeling too well this morning, and I was like, maybe I should just cancel today, and then I'm like, what am I going to do if I'm not feeling well, and what am I just going to sit on couch and watch Netflix all day? Get up and do something, Michael, and then you'll feel better, and you'll have actually accomplished something. Not that that's necessarily good advice for anybody else but myself, but that's just kind of a little bit about how I like to operate. Okay. My goodness, look at all these comments. Oh, Lolly says, look at my comment further up the chat, please. Well, he says, I have a question, Michael. I'm doing a piece that needs to look quite minimalistic, and I find the colors are clashing. How can I limit this? Limit my palette further? Just cool or warm, maybe? Um, how can you prevent your colors from clashing? Well, um, I... Uh, Well, there, there's literally tools online. Um, let me try to remember. Let me see if I can find some of those tools in my list here.
don't know if these are... Okay, one second, sorry, just... Uh... Okay. So I don't know if this uh, site is in the description below. I, I might have had them there at one point. But this website here coolers.co so c o o l o r s dot c o is a great website i've used this for coming up with um color uh, um, palettes for um, logos and and websites i used to design websites ages ago and um to, to kind of define the 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 palette that I would use for maybe a client, or I've even used this for myself, working on projects. And I'm, it's been probably about five years since I've used this, but um, maybe I'm not the best person to demo it now that I'm just sitting here thinking, how does this work again? I, uh, I know you go. I thought there was a way where you could just tap it and it would just keep on refreshing and giving you different... Anyway, there is a way of using... Well, here's the watch tutorial. So I'm not going to go through this, but I do love this site. This was a great way. So one of the things you could do if you're really stuck is you could uh, take a photograph or scan something you've been working on. Let's say you've got a color you really like is this orange. And then you could use this, uh, this page right here, which is, I think it's under color matching tools in the description below. Uh, then you could upload your file to this website. And then it's going to, and then you can, so let's say, let's choose a file. Do I have something here? Let's just upload a painting from last week. Um, let's say you want to know what this color is, that yellow. All right, so I tap on that. This will give me the hex number. So this is something that artists and designers use to get the exact specific color information. You could copy that. And then we could go to cool here. Tap that in. And now that color is, that's the color that we might decide, okay, I'm going to lock these in. I want these two colors. And then however it is, that we can refresh this. Hmm. Anyway, check, watch the tutorial, figure it out. That's how I would use that. Uh, how do I, how do you announce where your YouTube upcoming YouTube videos here on YouTube so you can hit the notification button and that takes you to the most recent uh, um, it'll, it'll give you a notification when I'm about to go live or when I've uploaded a a, um, a holder that, that says when this next video is taking place you can also join the Facebook group as well Look at there's uh, Sandra's saying hello, and um, there's Regina from Brazil. Awesome. Okay, so uh, let's keep on plowing ahead here. Now that I've got this stained, I want to move on to talking about who Hiroshige was. <laughs> And why he's so important, and maybe a little bit of backstory on this particular painting itself. So, 
here we go. So Hiroshige is born in 1797 and dies in 1858 at age roughly 60, 61 years old. And you can see by the date of the painting we're working on today, or the print that we're working from, is from 1857. So it is released you know, right before he dies. And probably the majority of the prints that were done from, um, from his original uh, sketches, to go back to that, uh, were created long after he died, over the next maybe 20 or so years. So, um, Hiroshige is arguably one of the most influential artists in modern art history, and I don't say that lightly, because his art influenced some of the most important artists, particularly in the Impressionist painters, were just blown away with his work. I think probably, I mean, there's lots of factors. I think one of the main factors of why the Impressionists were such a big fan of Hiroshige's work were is there was an opening up of Japan during the, the towards the very end of Hiroshige's life um, to global trade. And um, so there's a lot of Japanese art, uh, sculptures, books, paintings that are flooding the, the, the market in Germany and England and France. And so artists, you know, are obviously going to be interested what to see what artists from other places in the world are up to. So all of a sudden, all this art from Japan starts arriving in Europe and artists are just like, whoa, this is, it's like it's come from a different planet. We, because Japan had been closed for centuries. So th most of those, most people had never seen anything like this before. So it's just like, whoa, there's a totally different way of describing reality that we've never even, it's never even occurred to us before. So, and that it, also happens right at the moment that the, the Industrial Revolution is happening. So you have all of these new tools that are available to the Impressionist painters, like pre-mixed paints in tubes that allowed artists to go outside and paint in a way that was totally impossible before because artists were grinding their own pigments in the, up until the maybe 1870s. So you now have artists can just put paint tubes in their backpack and go for a walk. So you have, you have all of these new tools that aid expression in the West happening at the exact same time, an entirely unknown, hereto unknown uh, mode and, and a, a view of the world reaches Western shores. So it is ju it's just like, it, it, it was like perfect timing and you have, I think, in on this Wikipedia page, there's some mention of, you know, here's some of the like the influence. So, you know, some of the the main artists that are influenced by would be Claude Monet, uh, Edouard Manet. Not there, there, there are two artists with very similar last names. Monet and Manet were two probably the most famous impressionist painters. Edgar Degas, Camille Pissarro said that uh, Hiroshige was basically an honorary Impressionist painter or a proto-Impressionist. Um, you have a whole bunch of Russian artists as well that really admired the, the simplicity, the, the, the minimalist quality of a lot of Japanese art. Again, think about, you know, when we look at, you know, a painting like today's painting by Hiroshige, it is like completely different than the work of artists at that particular time in Europe. Artists in Europe at that time are, are going for hyper detail. You know, everything is painted in in complex layering of paint. And then all of a sudden you've got paintings like this where, you know, the sky or this far shore is just sort of very lightly kind of suggested, right? It's just like, you know, or, or even just the, the way that this image is composed, which is very much like prefigures photography, this 
composition where we, we don't see either side of the bridge. We just see the middle of the bridge. That's much more like how we take photographs today. This kind of thing would never have occurred to a Western artist at this time. It, it, again, I, it, was, it was like someone coming from another world and show, showing a completely different way of looking at the world here. So the idea of showing a bridge without the bridge connecting to anything, um, obviously we know it connects to something, but without that being shown, I, I, I don't think it ever been done before in Western art. So it's just like a complete you know, revelation. So the artists like the, the Impressionists were blown away. Vincent van Gogh was, you know, saw Hiroshige as probably his favorite artist of all time. He made a reproductions versions of all of these as we, we looked at before. And he collected many um, a prints, but I think there's 19 of them now in the collection of the uh, Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam that, that were owned by Van Gogh, that still have the pin marks that he had on the walls of his bedroom. And we know that, they, that he owned these, not only because he did versions of them, but he also included these paintings often in the background of other paintings that he made. So when he, when Van Gogh had people visiting them, some of these would just be on the walls of his bedroom. And so he, he would literally include those paintings in the background of his own paintings, right? So it's just, it's, um, uh, that the, the level of influence, like Cezanne, for instance, and Whistler, right? Remember we did a, a, the Whistler's mother um, were hugely influenced, like Cezanne, like the, the whole, you know, we wouldn't have cubism had we had artists like Cezanne not been, not seen Hiroshige's art, right? Because there's a, there's a, a lightness to Japanese, Chinese art, Korean art that, um, that, especially the way that they painted landscapes, like, uh, where there's a, it's, it's so much more poetic. Things aren't anchored into space the way that they are, you know, uh, in, in Western art, everything is sort of like, you know, there's foundations drilled into the ground supporting all of the mountains in, in Japanese art, Chinese art, you sometimes see these mountains that are kind of like floating amongst the clouds that the, sometimes the ground itself is not even defined. And that's, that would never have occurred to anybody in the Western world to do anything like that, right? That's, um, so, you know, so once you have artists from the West who are, who are become super influenced by by artists from Japan and and I should say like it's it, um, artists like Hiroshige and Hokusai Ho Hokusai who was about 40 years older so was kind of of the previous generation his art was also made uh, he, he also made prints or prints were made of his work maybe sometimes in collaboration with Hokusai uh, we'll talk about the whole printmaking process here in a moment but um uh, Hokusai's art, even though he was from an older generation, again, Japan was still closed at that time. So really his art also comes uh, onto the scene in Europe at the same time as Hiroshige's art. Um, and the, the two of them were amongst the most reproduced artists in Japan. So their art is really the ones that, that make the biggest impact in Europe once they finally get there. So even though there were plenty of, of great Japanese artists before, um, for thousands of years before, it's not really in, until Hiroshige and Hokusai's art, and Hokusai, again, I should maybe just, since I don't want to assume anybody knows who he is, is also obviously famous for the Great Wave. Um, and these two artists are often compared side by side. I think it's, you know, the, the difference between Hokusai and Hiroshige is Hiroshige's art 
is often considered to be much more uh, subtle, more poetic, more delicate. Um, there's there's a, maybe a quietness of in his work that in that is not quite uh, you know like Hiroshige's art is is bolder, more stylized. The colors are often more intense and saturated, um, whereas uh, Hiroshige's tends to be yeah there's this, there's in in many ways closer to the traditions of japanese and chinese art because japanese art was also heavily influenced by chinese art as well um and there's just so much to talk about here i don't <laughs> um what do i so maybe let's go to the, his biography uh so um I just remember who I'm talking about now. So Hiroshige, uh, as I said, is born in 1797. And he's also, his name is not Hokusai. Hokusai, or sorry, Hiroshige's name was not Hiroshige. Hiroshige was, was a name that he gave himself that is sort of like, um, uh, you know, a nom de plume or, you know, a stage name for an actor, right? So, um, which was, is not uncommon in Japan, um, and certainly not uncommon today. You know, so many actors have a different name that they were born with, but their stage name for various different reasons is, is, can be very different. So his original name is Ando Tokotura, and, um, or sorry, Ando Takataro. And so he, although when he's younger, he kind of changes his name a number of times here. We see here's Juman uh, Toko, Toko, Tokube and Tetsuzo. <laughs> Tetsuzo, Suzo. Tetsuzo, right? My apologies, I'm, I'm sure I'm totally destroying all of those names. I'm doing my best to honor what an artist I think is is you know top twenty of all time for sure. Um, and one thing I found really surprising, I had heard some people when doing my research talking about um, Hiroshige being of a, a samurai descent or even a samurai artist, and I was like, really? Is that, I don't know, but it turns out that's true. Um, Hiroshige was descended um, from uh, this military nobility which you know we call today a samurai it doesn't necessarily mean that his great grandparents were walking around with samurai swords and fighting um, but he comes from a particular sort of lineage of people that were kind of these like a warrior class uh, that, that were uh, maybe different than the way we think of like um, soldiers today being you know, often some of the, the the less wealthy classes in the first world anyway, right? Um, but in Japan, that warrior class was seen as being maybe not the, the, the highest uh, um, class, but, but higher, that they were um, seen as sort of like knights and, and very much appreciated. But not all of them necessarily all, all fought either, right? Some of them were, you know, generals and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, um, uh, his father was, um, um, where is it here? His father was the fire warden. So the, you know, fire warden would, is, you know, like the, the fire chief who, who sort of tended over uh, this castle in Edo or Edo, sorry, Edo also, I should say, is what we know today as Tokyo. So in the sense, so the, this, this really important kind of historical monument in the center of Tokyo was, was sort of under the watch of Hiroshige's father. And when Hiroshige's father dies quite suddenly, the year after his mother dies. So in 1909, when Hiroshige is 11 years old, his mother passes away. The following year, his father passes away. And Hiroshige inherits his father's responsibility to, 
um, to tend this castle and to uh, because a lot of buildings in Tokyo in Japan are made of wood right so this is, it's not a it's not a a role to to be taken lightly right if your job is to help secure the the the, the um, you know a, a important historical structure made of wood right and and the rest of the cities largely made of wood and paper um, it, that's a very, very important role. Having said that, while Hiroshige is tending this uh, castle, he's there's. It's not like there's a fire every day, right? Knock on wood. So he has a lot of time to himself to read and eventually study art and draw. So he's he finds himself kind of sketching and drawing. And eventually becomes decides he's, that's one thing he's going to devote himself to. So he has a series of different teachers over this time, um, and so he learns very traditional Japanese techniques as well as some of the important Chinese techniques because um, a lot of the the um, Japan and China in terms of art history borrowed from one another back and forth. And a lot of the the uh, the techniques that we think of as being Japanese often originated in China and were sort of amalgamated into Japanese art. Um, and also, uh, Hiroshige learns a little bit about Western art. West, some, there is a little bit of Western art makes its way into. Uh, Japan, and really probably the most important of which is perspective. So this concept of illusionistic perspective, geometric perspective, that is such an important part of Western art, especially at this time, um, slowly starts to kind of make its way into Japan. And we see a lot of Japanese art starting to um, have, especially when they draw architecture, include these Western concepts of uh, the landscape and cityscapes. So he's familiar with all that, and there's, there's work by Hiroshige that, uh, that demonstrates all of this. He also becomes a... Um, so here, here we are, this, this particular kind of um, approach that we see in Japanese art that uses Western style perspective. Um, Hiroshige also becomes trained in this yukiyoi style of printmaking, and yukiyoi is um, is there a link to this? Is a, is a tradition, basically kind of a wood block um, etching, where you you take a block of wood and then you you well you draw on a piece of paper you do a sketch on a piece of paper and then that sketch is placed face down onto a block and it's glued down onto that block and then you what depending on the kind of you can either peel the backing off of it kind of like a sticker or you you can literally start carving into that surface and eventually that paper just disintegrates or you wipe it off and then you ink it up, and then you put a piece of paper, and then burnish it down, and then now you've got your print. And that was how Hiroshige's art was created. Now, it's probably very unlikely that he did any of the printing himself. The, the way that Japanese artists worked to create these prints in, is um, maybe gives... Um, it maybe doesn't quite do justice to the to to the labor and skill of the of the other people involved in creating let's say today the work we're going to do today because although let's say Hiroshige did the the initial sketch of of let's say a, a print like this someone else would have done the transfer and then done the the actual cutting an, uh, an etching, scraping away of the wood, somebody else would have inked it up and then done the print. So you're talking about Hiroshige just being the first of 
probably two, three, four other people who worked on this on this artwork that we now see today. So it's unfortunate that it's not like you know uh, uh, we don't know the names of those other people because how much influence did that first person who starts to cut into that block have over the eventual outlook or the 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 way that this looks oh, i just want to see if we can find um any images of this process here Hmm. I just want to see if... Wow, this just keeps going on. This is quite a far-ranging article here. Um, oh, here we go. This looks... Okay, so this gives you an idea of how complex the art we're looking at was made. So originally, this would have been sketched out that sketch is applied to a block of wood, and then it's carved away over probably, you know, a course of several weeks. And then it's inked up, so that's why it looks kind of gray or charcoal kind of colored, is because prior to this, it looked like a block of wood, and then it's inked up, and it obviously completely changes the way it looks. It goes much darker. But all of these lines are raised, kind of like a stamp, right? So, well, here's the show's kind of uh, probably a group of people working on this process. Um, do I want to come back to this? So, and you know, another interesting thing about today's artwork is that it features both some natural dyes that were common at the time in Japan, um, like crushed up seashells to make white. Uh, uh, ink, you have uh, flowers that are used to create the the reds and the pinks, but the the way that you know the blue that we see at the very bottom of this print by Hiroshige was actually imported from Germany. So we are it's now or wasn't known as Prussia at, at the time, and um, so it which is a synthetic pigment that was not available in Japan at the time. Japan, early Japanese prints would have been, you know, if you had blue in them, over time would have changed color and gone a little bit more um, kind of brownish. Okay, so there's no images of printing there. What else do I want to say about Hiroshige before I move on here? Um, uh, it, so, it really this... Um, uh, Yukioi type of printing really focused primarily on images of like flowers, of women, of kabuki theater, and maybe a little bit of landscapes, but mostly the landscapes exist in the background. It's really not until Hiroshige comes around that he he really transformed this ancient uh, form of printmaking. And, and introduced landscape art or into the vernacular of this particular uh, uh, medium. Uh, so it's not really until he's in his mid-30s that he starts making the work that he's most known for. And like Hokusai, his sort of uh, elder artist from the previous generation who had been so influential in creating this 36 views of Mount Fuji, of which the Great Wave is, is famously a part of, um, it was quite common for artists to, Japanese artists to work in these series. So they would, they would create not just one artwork, as maybe Western artists did and still do, but create you know, a series of maybe five, eight, 30, or in, the, in today's painting, at least 100, right? 119 that we know of. Um, and part of the 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 um, the goal of doing these big sets is first of all you you encourage people to buy more because often these prints were, were quite inexpensive 
right? Like, especially the, the print that we're, that Hiroshige did, that we're, we're going to be painting today. You could buy that in Tokyo for about the same price as you'd buy a bowl of ramen, right? So, uh, you're, you're talking, you know, like, which would be today, like buying a cup of coffee. So they're really cheap. They're very accessible. They, they certainly would not have been considered art by even Japanese people at the time. They were considered to be like posters or postcards, not necessarily disposable, but, you know, something maybe, you know, something that, that people of a lower class could buy and appreciate, but not um, something that like the king or the, or the emperor would, uh, would, would be hanging in their house, right? Um, so it's, it's often the kind of things you might see in a restaurant or a cafe um, on someone's wall, or maybe, you know, literally posted up on a, like a, quote unquote, like a bulletin board on the street somewhere. And so by making a series of prints, you're encouraging people to, you know, buy more than just one in order to collect them all, like, like baseball cards or something, right? Um, what else do I want to say here before I move on? Um, it's interesting that Hiroshige had two followers, neither of which were directly related to him, but they were um, people that kind of uh, studied under him. Well, the first, Hiroshige the second did, but... Um, you know, he married Hiroshige's daughter. So, the, but, you know, so the, the son-in-law, but, but took his father-in-law's name, or again, his stage name, if you, if you have it, right? Um, and can kind of continued on and, and actually completed this particular project of documenting these views of uh, Edo or Tokyo as we know it today. Um, it's also kind of sad that Hiroshige himself was never particularly wealthy. He wasn't a great businessman. Um, this, even, even though he, he had become quite well known within Japan, because he didn't live long enough to see his influence in, uh, elsewhere. Uh, you know, he, like, for instance, this particular project here, the 100 Famous Views of Edo, uh, he was paid up front, a, a, you know, not a, a small amount, but, you know, not, I mean, but it was much to live on for maybe, a, you know, a couple of months. So he, he's paid up front for it. And obviously the, the, the man that, that commissioned him to make this, uh, certainly probably made money hand over fist afterwards on that project. Uh, but this project he makes, I also don't think Hiroshige was, necessarily um, uh, motivated by money or fame either. So it's not necessarily a sad story of a guy getting ripped off. In fact, when he makes this series of artworks, he's, you know, kind of in semi-retirement, he decides to dedicate himself to Buddhism and becomes a monk. And he's sort of working on this project over the last few years of his life. Um, as almost like a meditative experience. Um, so, you know, he dies at age 62 when there's a huge cholera epidemic that sweeps through Tokyo, although it's not known if that affected him, if that's what caused him to die. Um, but I love that uh, he composed this final poem and he says, I leave my brush in the east and set forth on my journey. I shall see the famous places in the western land. And of course, we think of that now as like, oh, did he have some sort of prophecy that, you know, in Western art, Western artists like Van Gogh and Claude Monet would would embrace his work? I mean, I no. Uh, <laughs> it it sounds really great, but really, the the Western land as as Hiroshige would have defined it was really more just talking about the west of Tokyo, as well as it's, it's sort of a, uh, a place within, um, uh, uh, Buddhist, 
you know, um, it's it's like a the, the where Buddhists go up, up after dying, right? It's like this the the paradise that exists after death. Uh, but it is kind of there's uh, there is something you can't help but but think like th that is a very interesting coincidence that this artist leaves that uh, little that that this poem upon his death which does strike us today as m somewhat prof pro <laughs> prosthetic prophetic uh, that uh, that his work would eventually have this huge influence in Western culture. Um, I think, I think maybe that might be good. I just think that today's painting is, um, and, and Hiroshige himself is just such a, like, uh, Man, had it not been for him, I wouldn't be here today. Who knows what Western art would look like today? Probably, you know, maybe we would have arrived at the same place eventually, but probably an extra 100 or 200 years uh, of, you know, of neoclassical art, you know, the kind of art that, you know, we, like, for instance, we've... we've like the Napoleonic era, just for simplicity, right? The these much more you know, we wouldn't have the looseness of of uh, the, that we identify with impressionism. Um, we wouldn't have artists. We wouldn't we wouldn't have cubism and this idea of sort of breaking the stranglehold that that geometric perspective had on Western art for 300 plus years um, and the kind of the more poetic approach that we saw in in Western art. We wouldn't have abstract painting for better or worse had it not been for someone like Hiroshige. So, um, yes, I should move on here. I've been talking way too long. Okay, so... Um... Underpainting. Let's think. Do I want to do an underpainting? I think I could, but you know what? The the way that I've done my outline here, I used a relatively new piece of carbon paper, so it is pretty dark. So I'm not super worried about that. And I think because of the way that I'm going to print this, or not print this, paint this, I'm thinking about prints because it is a print, is maybe kind of painting fairly light over top of this anyway. So I think I'm going to forego an underpainting, although I do wonder about possibly applying a color, kind of like an eggshell color over top of this which would have been much closer to the paper that it was printed on. So if I just, oops. You know, so here's the original, this is, as I said, th th this, okay, so here, this is one of the earlier versions at the Metropolitan Museum of Art of this. And you can see these other two boats in the background. Look how you can even see the, the details of these boat houses in the back. Oh. Of course, that's not on camera. Ah! Okay. So, um, here's the 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 background of uh, the artwork at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This is one of the early prints here. So you see, here's these two boats. Here's the boat houses, and I think let's just look at this version. This is a much later version where we don't see those other two boats. And though there are these houses here, the boat houses on the far shore, they're almost totally indistinct. I'm so, I'm so glad I was looking for this all day today. And, and just out of serendipity, it happens to be that there's, I've got a whole bunch of links to different versions of this from different museums. And here it is, the first one I click on, great. 
That's, that makes, that's awesome. Um, but I think what I want to do is I'm going to mix this color and paint this over top of the painting uh, so that I can kind of have it kind of showing through. So to mix this color, what I'm going to do is mix a kind of um, a sandy brown. And do I want to do a warmer or cooler? I'm going to do a warmer color because... We do have this bridge right in the foreground with that color. So I'm going to take my, actually, yeah, let's take my warm yellow. We don't, uh, let me see, let's make it a little bit more. Now let's take some warm red. We don't need too much of it. Otherwise, it's going to get really orangey. And then let's take a little bit of blue. We, again, we, ah, that might have been too much bit more yellow. Okay, and um, let's take this white. Was any of that on camera? Great. <laughs> I'm off to a great start today. Uh, okay, I need more white. That's pretty close. Now I'm going to add some medium in here to thin it out, which is going to make it a little bit more transparent. So I'm just going to add a little bit more white and it's going to make it a little bit lighter. But I want it to be a little bit lighter. Okay. Because it's going to get a little bit darker as I make it more transparent. Now I could have done this as a stain, as the Imprimatura, obviously. Um, but I kind of, I always like building up those colors. Now obviously that image has started to disappear. I'm not too afraid of that because um, it's as it dries, it should get a little bit more transparent. If you do find it getting a little bit too thin or too opaque, you can kind of try to brush some of that out and then scrape a little bit off. Now I kind of got to be kind of quick here because it's starting to dry. And the more it dries, once it starts to kind of get, so okay, so I got maybe another couple seconds here. Okay, cool. a little bit more on the pinkish side. Now if I look at that. Okay. 
It's close. As I said, it might look a little bit more pinky. But I don't mind that. Okay, so let's just clean this brush off. If I didn't want it to be so pinkish, then I could probably, I would just put a little bit more yellow in there. I would actually, you know, I was expecting it to go a little bit more yellow by putting, I put some matte medium in there. Matte medium is just clear paint. And I was expecting more of the yellow underneath to infuse this color. It is possible that after I blow dry this, which I will do here in a moment, that that yellow from below will come through. And so it might go, go a little bit more yellow than this current uh, peachy kind of quality. Although, again, I, I don't mind that. It's just a little bit different than I was expecting. But as always, just because it's different than what I expected doesn't mean it's bad. Okay, that's a beautiful surface. Oh, that makes me so happy. Um, and I don't know if you can see, the lines are all still there. It just may be a little bit harder to see on camera. But, you know, when I cut my hands like that, you can kind of see those lines there. So, um, getting that mixture just right. And also, you know, again, when I was brushing it, you have to be careful. Like, if I had gone just even a couple more seconds, I would get more... Let me see if I can even show this on camera. This will may not even show up at all. It's very subtle. But this here... Maybe you can see that a little bit. So this is where the brush kind of pulled and it started, it was drying and it just sort of, you know, it's like the skin, let's say you left some milk out overnight and then you got that little skin on there and you kind of pull it, it just sort of tears a little bit of the surface. So that's why I was kind of going quickly. And then once I, start, I started feeling that the paintbrush sticking onto the surface, it's like, okay, done I, I mean whether i like it or not it's done and i just have to if i don't if i'm not happy with it i'm gonna have to let it dry and then and fine tune it but 
continuing to brush it is gonna is gonna be catastrophic. So you just have to be like, okay. Sometimes you've got no wind to hold them, no wind to fold them, no wind to stop brushing paint across the surface, no wind to get out the hair dryer and and dry the canvas. that out of the way awesome you know it's one of those things like I don't know there's something about the prepping of the surface of the canvas that just gives me such like energy like you know I, I know not everybody likes doing an imprematura but there's something about just like this already feels to me like the painting is on its way to success and I, I hate thinking I'm like oh don't don't jinx yourself Michael but there's something about that that already feels like the there's that it's successful you know it's like um, and that everything else is just a matter of of doing right that that's why I think the, the these foundational parts of a painting are so important and yet so many people today neglect it and then they wonder why they're not happy with the art they make it's like there's a reason why every great painting you've seen in a museum up until you know 1870 or something was done with this similar sort of approach oh, okay <laughs> Uh, Lolly says, I like that version of uh, The Gambler by Kenny Rogers. Uh, no wind to stop fiddling. And Sandra says, oh, I heard that famous Canadian folk singer passed away. Gordon Lightfoot, yes. Um, he was amazing. And it's one of those things you just sort of take some of those, sometimes those people for granted. And then you, you're like, oh my goodness. You know, all this stuff lately coming up just over the past 24 hours about Gordon Lightfoot, and you're like, I mean, he's just, he was just, is sort of like, especially in Canada, kind of like um, water. You're just like, oh, well, it's always going to be there. Of course, we're, I mean, and then all of a sudden, you're like, oh my goodness, that guy is like, all, and then all this, the song, you're like, he wrote that song? He wrote that song? Oh my goodness. Edmund Fitzgerald, obviously, being the, Probably the most famous, and it is a great song, but so many other ones. Anyway, I am really <laughs> off in different tangents today. It must be the 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 day quill. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me, my cough just going right in the microphone. I should mute it next time. I just have to remember next time I'm going to cough. I've got to plan it. I need one of these intertitles. For coughing. Uh, where am I? Okay, so let's work on the background next. So it's worth just mentioning how complicated this original print actually was. Anybody who knows, who's tried to do any printmaking, would probably, I'm sure, would, would not probably, would look at this and be kind of astounded. Because, uh, for all sorts of reasons. First of all, there, in, to create this, obviously Hiroshige did a, a drawing that is then transferred onto a block, and then the initial wood block is cut. And so that initial wood block probably would have featured the man on the raft, it would have featured the the people on the bridge and the bridge itself as well as the signature i think that would have all been there in that first block and then a second block would have been created that would have had um these the the trees in the background and the and the the boat houses and probably that would have been it and then you have a, a separate block for each color. 
So for instance, the yellow would have been a block. So there, that's one block that just has a couple small shapes. You would have had a block, another block carved entirely by hand out of wood for the railing. Um, another one for the, the stands here on the bridge. Um, another one for the sky, another one for this water. And to, to print this water and that fading, that is also, that's super tricky because that's also done, you can't do that in a block. You're, you're having to kind of fade that in after it's printed very quickly. So you see all of these, like the sky, that would have been done um, immediately after the, the, the page is pulled. I, I mean, it's... So you, I don't know how many, we could, we could just try counting how many blocks we have. We obviously have the black, and often that would have been done first, well, sometimes, um, and then colors applied over top of it, depending on how complex or how many colors. So let's say we've got, we've got black, we've got this uh, sky, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight, nine, ten, eleven. I, so I'm, I'm thinking there's probably 11 to 12, 13 different blocks to make this one print. And of course, and then you're talking, there's 119 as part of this series that him and he or she gave the second did so I mean, you're you're talking maybe for every for every one of these somewhere between maybe ten to fifteen blocks. So it, you know you got a thousand blocks that have to be carved. You can see why it would have taken maybe a decade or so to get all of these prints completed. It's a it's a huge. Um, oh, oh, and then of course the rain. That's a, a separate block that's probably done over top of all of that. Oh, anyway, just, okay, so how do I, let's see, where should we start? Let's do the, let's do the sky. Now, that sky, I think it's also, hmm. I just want to check, I want to look, how did Van Gogh approach this? It's interesting Van Gogh's, I guess, oh, he does have brush strokes. I bet you Van Gogh, for the the rain, probably scraped that paint off. I bet Van Gogh painted that maybe a black imprimatura. In fact, I bet you that's exactly what he did. And then he's painting with oil paint and then probably used the back of his paintbrush or maybe a knife and scraped the paint off to create those brush strokes. I can't be sure, but and this is not the highest resolution image, but hmm. I just you know I, I, it does look like it might be black because just the way that he's painting these pillars is he's used, leaving a little bit like kind of like the way we did the Henrietta Shore painting a little while ago where we painted kind of a darker color underneath and then just kind of painted little gaps, left a little gap of that darker color. So we're painting lighter colors on top of that dark, but just leave a little gap and that creates the line in between. Okay, so let's make, let's make a, let's make a gray. Okay. So let's take our blue, our cold blue, and our cold yellow, and our warm red. If we've got equal amounts of those, they should cancel each other out and turn into a black.
All right, looks a little bit on the green side. Just tells me I need a bit more red. I need to put just a bit too much red in there, of course. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, maybe it's okay. Just need to mix all that green in thoroughly. Okay, so now I've got my gray, or my black, sorry. Let's squeeze a bit more white onto the canvas or palette. Um, let's get rid of some of this. It's, you know, still, still a little bit green. Let's put just a bit more. There we go. So there's our black. Let's take some white. You can, by adding white to the color, it reveals what, um, how, how, what kind of gray you actually have. Because it's hard, you're looking like, I don't know, is that purple? Is that green? I have no idea. All right, so it's hard to, t to identify what color a, a, a dark color is until you add some white to it. So here's my gray. Now that's we're gonna add a little bit more blue back into it. Now I could have just made this and then just added, you know, so just added a little bit less yellow and red to it. But this is the way I've gone about things. And that's pretty close, let's just see. Ah. Okay, I like how that looks. I think I am gonna add a little bit of medium in it again to thin it down. So this is just adding some matte medium which means it's going to be a little bit more transparent and let in a little bit of that brown or paper color, the eggshell or unbleached titanium, whatever you want to refer to that khaki kind of color that we got here. And what I want to do is I want to paint basically all of this except the print. Uh, the the name of the series and the name of the painting itself. The what we have here is the red and the yellow. Now I could just paint over all of that. In fact, I could paint over right over these bushes, the trees and the boathouses. But I think I'm just going to keep this fairly straightforward. And I don't mind if it gets a little bit transparent and kind of uneven in places. 
because you could see that that's happening in the original anyway. And we're also going to cover it with rain, so that rain can also really tidy up any perceived um, imperfections. Now that is a there's a it is a bit streaky. Um, and I do have a lot of this paint I made. Uh, so I might do another coat of that. And let me just see how, how does that color now look? It does. It did go a little bit more gray when I applied it on top of that. So probably one of the reasons why it looks a little bit more gray and less blue than I had kind of my my mixture is that because there's this kind of slightly um, peachy color, the red in there is sort of taking a bit of the is her counteracting the blue and making it a bit more gray. Something I kind of maybe failed to anticipate. So that's just something to think about. Do I want to mix it again and do another coat? Or can I live with it? <laughs> Let's just see. Um very, I mean, it's, we're talking splitting hairs here, but it is a little, I might, I, I might, let's, let's, yeah, why not? Let's, Although, should I, should I just move on with life? I'm just going to use the same color and just touch up a few places here. Rather than mix that color. And again, notice I'm touching it up after it dried. If this was oil paint, there'd be no reason to do this. Uh, to wait for it to dry, you just do it right then and there, but 
with acrylic paint. Kind of got to get it. Um, again, if I had tried doing this while the paint was still wet, I probably would have caused me a bit of grief. just one of those things when I'm doing these, especially tackling one of the greats of all time. <laughs> you know, you're just like, oh, I kind of want to get it right, but then I have to remind myself of the stuff that I always tell everybody else to do. <laughs> like, ah, stop fiddling around with it, guys. And then here I am fiddling around with things. Sometimes I like getting these edges, but maybe not totally opaque. I kind of I like it when you see a little bit of that yellow poking through. But because I, I think of these as like as objects, uh, which is I always had arguments with some teachers in art school about that. Like that I like to think of paintings as as objects, and and that just you know it's like kind of like very flat sculptures, which I, I had one teacher just almost lost his mind about that. Um, but I've always been very conscious of the edge of the painting and the sides of the painting. Well, he said Harry Belafonte passed away as well. He made some, yes, Harry Belafonte. Great music, great actor, great very important activist. I mean, Harry Belafonte. I mean, yeah, he's a legend, legend for sure. I mean, maybe even more important than I mean as I think towards the end of his life Harry Belafonte was known more for his music, but uh you know, to a certain generation, probably thinks of Harry Belafonte as more of a, an activist, social rights activist, than than an actor or musician, maybe. Deborah says, "Yes, Saint Gordon Lightfoot. He was and is my inspiration." Okay. Um, now I wonder if I can use. The same color I have here, and if I could turn it into, you know, use it for here. That same color, maybe I, in this case, maybe I will, I'll make this a bit of a darker, I'll, I'll make it darker, put a little more black, but also put a more blue in there. And so that uh, it pops forward just a little bit more. Okay, so let's mute this. You can really see the difference. There's so this is the print that we're we're working from for today's painting that I have in the Dropbox. I think I'll I'll make another version 
of this, uh, another JPEG of the one here at the Met, Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. You can see so much more detail. And maybe my color in the background is a little closer to this one anyway. So maybe I'm just... <laughs> um, hmm. Yeah, I mean, you can see that that color... He, so that would have been one big... So essentially what I could have done, and I could still do, is apply that color here and then paint over it. Okay, so let's let me do that. And okay. So, I'm going to take this color I'm just leaving a little ridge or a little line in between just to make it easier for me to find kind of the rough outline of where I guess they go all the way across though, don't they? At least in, in this version. If we look at the original, or not the original, the a later version, you can see how much different that Okay, now in light of that, I think I'm going to paint the water next and then do that far shore afterwards. And again, the water 
on the in these two paintings or prints is different. So here's the one that we were working from. That's the Met. You can see the one at the Metropolitan's got a bit more of a teal quality to it. I think I'm gonna go for a bit more of a teal because I like that look. And I also think it's probably, well, it would have been made, I don't, I wonder if this would have, if uh, Hiroshi had actually saw the finished print before he died. Uh, that would be, it's, that's, would be debatable for sure. So, how should we go about this? Let's take... Let's take our cool blue, cool yellow. Let's make it. Oops. Cool yellow. Oh, it's a bit too much green. And let's take a bit of black and a bit of white here. Maybe should I not have put black in there? Black might have killed some of that energy that's in there. Maybe some more white. I kind of like that anyway. I might use that. It's a little bit too dark. So I'm just going to put a bit more. You know, it just it occurs to me, I'm like, why, how come I'm not getting the same results? It's because I'm not using the same white as I've been using throughout most of these episodes. I, I don't have any of the, the Amsterdam paint white. I'm using um, a, a different brand, this Opus, which is an art supply store here in Canada. And this is a, a heavy body acrylic, so it's thicker, heavier, more expensive, and higher quality, meaning... It's um, more opaque than the white that I've been using from the Amsterdam paint. So, uh, you know, using the same approach I've used for 280 plus episodes and paintings, it's I'm having slightly different results. Which is not too, like totally, shouldn't be unexpected, but I just wasn't really, it didn't occur to me until just, literally now. <laughs> I'm going to put a bit more yellow in here. Because it's kind of gotten a little bit... lost a little bit of the saturation that I kind of was like, nah, it's a little bit too much white, so... Light me is getting kind of green. It's, it's definitely going to be different than... Let me just see how different this is from the original. 
or not the I keep saying the original, but that's going to be very different. Okay, so just when we get to that part in the video, and, and we'll just be just uh, that'll be why this looks the way it does, right? You know, I'm basically approaching this painting in a totally different way than I was exp I was planning on it. I was planning on sort of almost painting this as a bit of like a watercolor. Here I am painting very thick, opaque acrylic across the whole surface, so... Just goes to show, you know, you can, what do they say, man plans, God laughs. <laughs> you come in with a kind of an idea, I've been thinking about this painting for weeks, and it's like, once the paint starts getting on the canvas, the painting just starts going in a different direction. Let's blow dry that. <laughs> okay, it just occurred to me that I forgot to paint the down below here as well so before I go too much further let's take care of that and how do I want to do this I think
So my plan here, so I'm just gonna paint the vertical beams. in the water and then paint the cross beams and stuff afterwards. Right, that way I'm not painting all day long in between all of these different shapes of the beams. Now I'm thinking just based on my own experience of painting for decades, that this will save me some time. Pretty confident it will, but uh, it would have a you know very different look than if I took my time and painted into through the the, the water in between all these little bits of wood. Now, by no means are these pillars sort of, uh, does it mean that I, I can't put any back on top of th this, right? Just this, these are just kind of placeholders to help me with the composition. So another reason why you see me wiping paint away because I want to make sure I don't have too many ridges that could cause me headaches later. Keep this about as flat as I can. my original plan was I was going to paint basically this right over top of all of this in like a kind of a watercolor approach but obviously that didn't happen because using this um, this paint that had so much that had this very this uh, titanium white from a different company that's much higher quality and therefore way more opaque. Um, didn't let me get the opacity that I wanted. Which is frustrating, I guess, but it doesn't mean that 
It's a disaster. It's just you know that's, I, that's when you know when you hear artists talking about like a painting is alive. That's this is sort of what they mean. This is a pretty good example of this type of a situation where you you begin with sort of one you know approach and because of the material the paint you're sort of forced to go in a different direction and in that way the painting is you know lifelike in the sense that it's it's behaving you know unlike you know a robot that does exactly what you program it to do it's more it has more of a life and it's just sort of dictating things which is can be super frustrating for sure um But you know, that's just life. Life's always throwing us curveballs. Which is frustrating. And you know, I can imagine that's why some people don't like paintings. They're like, I got enough curveballs in my life as it is. I don't need an, any more, you know, unexpected things frustrating me but I guess for me painting it, it sort of dealing with the unexpected curveballs in painting I think helps me deal with the unexpected curveballs that happen in life outside of painting you know, because if I can overcome a curveball, an unexpected surprise in painting, and I can manage to recover from that, it kind of tells me that, well, maybe, maybe I can do the same thing in other parts of my life. Maybe if painting, maybe painting can teach me something. It can prepare me you know, steal me, or gird, you know, build up some uh, strength in other parts of my life that maybe I lack. You know, maybe it can give me some confidence to tackle things that... that... Uh, feel are beyond my ab present abilities because if I can tackle it here maybe I can maybe I'm not so helpless after all <clears throat> Sandra says yes that's like when I had a bunch of that open white titanium it throws you off yeah definitely it throws, you know, when you use a different, introduce a different brand into your, your, um, palette, into your toolbox, you know, in an ideal world, what one would do would be to mix another palette, you know. I mean, this, this happens to me all the time when I'm teaching in person, and, you know, I like to use the same brand that we're using here in my, my in-person classes, because I've, I've obviously been using it a lot, so I, I, I pretty good idea of what to expect but every once in a while you know I, I realize I'm oh, we're out of paint and there's an art supply store kind of right across the street from um, where I teach so, uh, so there's times where I'm like I'll be right back <laughs> and then I go get some paint and come back and then I, I almost every time I do that well every time I do that there's always somebody's like I I'm really having a tough time mixing this color. What? And I, and I was like, oh no, it's, well, you just need a little bit more of this. Let, let me just show you. And then I start mixing it and I, 
Oh, this is the blue that I just got, isn't it? Ah, huh. Good to know. This is, it's not behaving the way I expect it to behave. Okay, well, okay, everybody, this blue has got a little bit of white in it, or it's a little bit warmer than I thought it was going to be. So, but I think recognizing that is the first step to being able to, to incorporate it or deal with it or use it, right? And that only really comes with familiarity and experience, unfortunately. Okay, let's blow dry this. Okay, what I think is kind of wild is when this print was being made, it's very unlike, it's, it's quite likely that it looked quite similar to what we see here. Probably this, that we would see the, the negative space between all of these crisscrossing beams down here. But, you know, it's not too far off from that initial first few pulls of the print by the printer. I always love thinking about that, that um, of sort of getting to a similar place that the artist was in their own, in, in, in their version of the painting. Um, because I, th I think we're just so used to seeing a painting in its finished state that we forget that at some point it would have looked not too dissimilar from what we have in front of us here. Um, and that that can also be be um, uh, calming <laughs> to, to recognize it if you're like oh no what's going on here I've lost everything well probably the, other, the artist herself himself would have been in that same sort of situation now they probably you know they're not so fixated on maintaining the lines for from our image transfer so when those disappear, they're not like, oh no, because they're coming up with it on the spot. So they don't know where those lines are going to go yet. Okay. That is very green. <laughs> oh, goodness. Especially when I put that second coat over it. I don't know. But I don't mind, right? That's This is the one at the Met. That's how it looks. I mean, definitely much darker, more saturated, but let's see how Van Gogh himself did. Oops, let's see back. Uh, a little bit closer to old Vincent, right? Oops, let's go one more. Huh, that's funny. We're, we're, we're much closer to Van Gogh's version than uh, Hiroshige's. That's pretty funny. Hmm. But also, again, not entirely surprising because, you know, we're doing a painting of a print just as Vincent van Gogh was doing a painting of the print. So it's more likely that our painted version is going to look more like the other painted version and less like the print. I was hoping that we would get a little bit closer in between Van Gogh and Hiroshige, but we might be closer to Van Gogh and maybe a little bit past Van Gogh at this rate. <coughs>
Well, there is still a long way to go on this, and I still got, I was saying three and a half hours, four hours. Yeah, that's, that's, if I race from now, I'll make that, so. <sighs> Let's, where should we do next? I mean, I guess there's the darker part in the top, the darker part in the bottom, and these fellas. Hmm. That paint is almost all dry. I was planning on using some of it for these darker... Mm. Hmm. So, that's not going to happen. But maybe we can... Beaten up. Let's take. Let's just. I'm gonna take my gray. A bit more blue in here. Hmm. Yeah, it needs to be darker. That's pretty good. Maybe a little bit more on the blue side of things. But that's also not such a bad thing either. I'm just gonna wipe that off. Cause I wanna get, try to get it, paint this with a bit of a smaller brush. small do I really want to go? Well, I think I'm going to be here all night long, so <laughs> um, let's zoom in. Uh, let's go to the Met version here again. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to get that much detail in here. Well, maybe. Let's see. We got a, one of these boat houses.
So I'm just trying to very quickly fake out the look of like some vegetation and such. Trees. It's pretty sloppy, but again, this is all detail that's going to be mostly hidden. And I didn't even put this in my outline because I didn't even see it because the other print that I was using doesn't really have it. I mean, probably now that I see it here in this version from the Met, I might, uh, it might be more apparent to me, but... Even all this to me just feels like ah, it's a little bit too distinct. I don't know. Whoa. So you can see that's way, 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 way more distinct than in the print, the version that we're working from, or at least I'm working from right here. But... I also don't mind that, you know, now, of course, this is also not nearly as dark, but I'm just going to leave it and just keep on painting. Thanks. Just 
splattered some water on here so make sure it's not going to dissolve. Okay, it's coming along. Should I do the... Let's let that dry. Let's work on the bottom half here and get the, um, the water d oh, down there next. Okay, now that that is a brilliant that prussian blue is beautiful the prussian blue is is a bit of a, a warmer blue well it's it's kind of like on the in the middle here in fact um one of the things that i had somebody ask me this in my painting class in person. So I just want to show you this. I don't know if I put this resource here. Uh, Gamblin is the, the paint that I use for when I'm painting an oil. And I love Gamblin paint. I think they're the best oil paint out there. Um, Gamblin, Robert Gamblin was the chief um conservator at the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. for decades. And so he would often uh, mix original pigments to try to um, reproduce the exact mixture that artists were using in paintings 500 years ago so that you could mix that and apply it on the painting to make it as seamlessly invisible touch-ups uh, as he's repairing you know, severely damaged paintings. So then after he kind of retired or moved on from that, he started his own painting company in the mid-90s, late 90s. And I've, uh, I've been to the factory in Portland, Oregon. It's an amazing company. But, uh, and I've seen them making the paint. Oh, like if, for an artist, that is, that's like Mecca. Uh, but anyway. What, what's great is you can just Google Gamblin color temperature list and here's all of these colors. So you can go, you can scroll down by, um, by hue, it's like the temperature, I mean. You can go by the color family and look at all the blues. So for instance, you know, here's our, so when people argue with me, like ultramarine blue, that's definitely cold. Well, I don't know, I mean, I. First of all, I would trust Robert Gamblin over just some stranger on the internet, including myself. You don't have to take my word for it, but this guy is, is, is you know, got a paint company used by most of the great, if you're painting an oil paint, you're probably, you might be using Gamblin paint, right? So, um, what did I say I wanted to mix here? Prussian blue. So this Prussian blue, he's got it listed as cool. But it's also like pretty close to the um, to the middle of that spectrum here because we have ultramarine with 7.5. Yeah, so it's pretty close to the to the middle here because we have our cerulean blue. This is our cool blue. So you can see it's much further um, along the spectrum away from the center. So like for instance, cobalt. Uh, where's cobalt? So he has cobalt listed as a warm, but but cobalt's pretty much like right in the center. Or not, I mean, it's on the warm side, but it's... So our Prussian blue is, is also close to the center, which is why I've selected a cerulean blue 
um, because it's much further away from the center. So I've got my warm blue and my cool blue is kind of as far before that cool blue starts becoming a green or teal and my warm blue as far from this from cobalt and, and the middle uh, between you know so where it's just kind of lukewarm I've got it closer so it almost becomes like a purple and that's what gives me that a much broader range of blues because I can always mix them together interesting um, but so what this tells me is to make this Prussian blue like um, the color that uh, Hiroshige would have used is basically using a little bit of both colors in order to get that really bright saturation. Um, so how do I want to do this? Should I do this as a glaze? I might use glazing fluid and just buff it out. So, let's get a little bit more cool blue on here. Ooh, what a beautiful, I just love these, I just love color. Okay, so we're going to take that, mix these two guys together. Ooh, it's gorgeous. And I think I will probably go a little bit... Wow, that is just glows, hey? Ooh. I don't know if that comes across on camera, but boy, oh boy, that is beautiful. Um... Now, Prussian blue is also a little bit darker. But I think I'm going to... I might just go for this really, really bright color. Uh, why not, right? You only live once. So I just put some glazing fluid in there. Glazing fluid is like matte medium. The main difference being is that it has a slow dry property, slow dry chemicals in it. So that once I paint this down, I can buff it out a little bit. So let's get another brush ready. And that's a lot of paint on here. So how high do I want to make this? happy with the way I'm applying this.
let's just keep on going. How did I miss that? Just added a little bit of water in there to dissolve a bit of that paint. Glazing always happens when I get a little impatient and I put a bit too much I have too much paint on my brush. I don't know why I'm so stubborn and I never learn my lessons. <laughs> oh goodness gracious! And then I end up having I, I just I get impatient and I think I can go faster. I'm like ah I'm better than I was yesterday. I'll go just a little push push the push my luck here and we'll go a bit faster get this done and every time I do it the painting laughs back and it's like are you have you learned nothing Michael you you seriously think it's just gonna be different today no I don't think so so it is what it is let's keep on
So what I'm doing, again, I'm using my glazing fluid here and I'm just trying to get as little of it on my brush as possible. Because that makes it easier to buff it out when, when if, the mistake I made to start this is I just painted a big glob of it onto the surface. Was that not dry? So I blow dry that enough, darn it. So yeah, so I've got a bit of a ways to go here. It's also important that this brush stays as dry as possible. And when your blending brush starts getting wet, like, like it was when I began this, it just, you're just basically painting with it again. You're not blending it out or softening those edges. And that's, uh, that was the, the cause of the, my frustration here a little while ago. So as I go, I'm just the the where I'm applying the paint is getting smaller and smaller.
I don't know why. I've, I've done so many of these that I don't know why it takes me a, a, a while to click in with this technique, but it just does. So what I'm checking is to see if it is indeed dry. Uh, the paint will look a little bit shiny. Assuming you're using the the satin or otherwise known as matte glazing liquid, one reason I like using matte paints is when they when they're dry, they're not shiny. Versus that's why I always find confusing if I'm using glossy glazing fluid. It's like is it dry or is it wet because it's glossy either way when it's wet and dry right so at least when i'm using matte medium i can just look at it and go like oh it's still it's shiny so it's wet and uh i don't know about you but just my brain is just i've got a tiny brain and it, i'm it's harder for me to um i just need as much help as i can get to to um, get things right. The less confusion for me, the better. My finest hour here, folks. What's going on? Well, we're just going to cover it up with rain anyway, right?
Now, I'm my, my internal debate here is how dark do I actually want to make this? Because I really like that blue as it is. Do I want to do a little glaze with black down in there? Do I need to even raise this higher? I knew I should have blow dried that Markowski. See, I get impatient and I just. Okay, I'm just gonna, let's just, let's take a bit of black.
Is that not dry? Oh my goodness. Too impatient. Too impatient. Uh, I'm gonna leave that for a while because it's driving me crazy and it's probably a good idea just to move on from a place that's driving me crazy to um, this area up here where it's also quite dark so let's take some black mix this in here So let's let's learn a lesson, Michael. <clears throat> this is this is a lesson for me. Let's dry this brush off so we're not putting a big gob of wet glaze up there. Every time. I what am I doing wrong, brush? Okay, let's blow dry it. And there's Nikki there, and Pascaline says, I'm going back to sleep. Have fun, everybody. <laughs> oh, 
Awesome. So this is very also very similar to the way that the printmaker would have inked this up here. Obviously done in a much more skillful way than I am presently doing, clearly.
Not sure how many more of these I'll need, but I'm just going to go much darker now. You know, it just occurs to me, hi Sanju, great to have you joining us here. Um, probably the, a better strategy for doing this glazing would be to start with a small bit and then keep increasing going outward. I tend to kind of always start big and then get smaller and smaller, but it might make more sense to start small and get the habit, the routine of the how to glaze because I seem to forget every single time. <laughs> and then to build my way outward. I think that because the effect would be exactly the same, it's just that one might be more successful <laughs> over the other. I don't know. Like maybe, maybe that's how I was originally taught, and I just have completely inverted it in my mind. I, as a teacher myself now, I'm always kind of surprised how bizarre, you know, the interpret, how my students interpret my instruction. I, what? That's like literally the exact opposite of what I just said. Um, so it's probably, it's maybe it's very likely that I've just... Gotten it backwards. Okay. Okay, I think maybe I should probably move on from this step here. <clears throat> Still got so much to do anyway. I don't know why. Sometimes I just get, you know, focused on something and I just um, want to keep going. You just gotta move on. I 
And great to see you too there, Paul. I didn't, I didn't say hello earlier. Maybe you were there all along and I, I didn't uh, notice. The chat kind of blew up there for a while and there was a lot of comments rolling in and I lost track of things. Okay, so I think I'm ready to move on. I think I've got my background well enough established. You know, when we look at them like that side by side. So one thing with like you're doing blending like that, it can be kind of hard on your brush. So, you know, like, cause what's happened, you know, is I'm, I've got that, that little thin layers and I'm buffing it out with a dry brush and that paint starts to um, build up on your brush. And if you're not careful and you just let them sit there on the table for a while, it can ruin your paintbrush. So you wanna use, um, what I often use for blending brushes is just brushes that have, that are kind of seen better days and they're, you know, they don't kind of form nice shapes anymore. They're kind of a little bit spread out. Um, rather than throwing them away, they make great blending brushes. But these ones, they, they both have stains on them because so I'm just gonna let them soak in the water for a little bit. It's also, I, you don't want your brush soaking in the water too long because that's one reason why they will kind of start to, because if they're, especially if they're, they're in the water like that, they, the pressure causes the bristles to, you know, to spread out because the pressure of the weight on them is, is hard on the, those little hairs. <sighs> okay, I think finally ready to move three hours later onto another step. My goodness. Hey, here we are, three hours into it, and we're going to foreground for the first time. Um, but that's okay, because a lot of the, the important stuff with this painting is in the background. So while it would be nice to have gotten here earlier, everything we've done has served a purpose, and it's, it's, it's like the foundation for these, you know, in, in many ways, it's more important than what goes on in the background in this particular painting, right? Um, obviously we see all these characters and everything, but um, what we've got here is, we've got like most of the painting painted. It's just now we're gonna do the bridge. You know, the, this is the series. This is the title of the painting, and then the name of Hiroshige, the artist who did today's painting. So, where should we start? Um, the bridge is something I, I'm, <laughs> I don't really want to do because it's going to take me a while. Um, and I'm even wondering to myself, do I want to, if I, painting that bridge, you know, there's a lot of detail. Do I want to just paint gray, or do I want to paint gray and then outline everything with black? If I outline everything with black, I either have to use a Posca pen or a paintbrush, and then that's, um, paintbrush is, it would be time consuming and... Well, my eyes will get super crossed. <laughs> well, if I'm going to do it, let's do it. Let's just dive right in here and take care of it. Because otherwise, uh, sometimes you just got to... i got to tackle these parts. They're not going to go away. No one else is going to do it for me. So, which, how big, how much do I need? Let's, uh, I'm going to need to make another black, too, so I need to get a little more paint on here.
Let's make a bit more black. Let's take... Uh, Dark purple. It's a bit too much yellow. I think, yeah, well, maybe, not bad, actually. That's probably going to do it. Well, we'll see. It might be a little bit more on the brown side of things, but that might not be such a bad thing after all, anyway. Maybe... Or gray. Let's take a bit more. Is that too... Let me see how bright that is. Ah, too much red. Let's mute it back with a bit of... Let's take a bit of my warm blue. Put that in there. Could use cool blue, but let's put it. Ooh, yeah, it needs uh, some more cool blue. Pretty good. Let's make it a bit darker still. Well, it could go more blue, but I think I'm just going to move on. Because um, I think there's a lot of blue on the bottom of that painting, at least in mine. My, my, uh, that uh, blue on the bottom kind of kept encroaching higher and higher, so I think I'm maybe I should uh, keep it a little bit more on the gray side.
<laughs> Lolly says, I like your brush stroke. Or Paul says, I like your brush stroke. Lolly says, you're a background perfectionist. That's part of why we love you. Uh, Nikki says, I'm always delighted with your work, spending hours and hours online painting, teaching, and interacting with your dedicated students. Oh, you guys are so sweet. Well, he says, if your eyes aren't crossed by the end of the stream, have you even done a stream at all? Good point. That's... <laughs> Usually the first thing after, I, after these streams, I go upstairs and take my contacts out, because it's just like... Oh. Um. Okay. <sighs> and I just remembered I was going to do that a little glaze. Is it, uh, Just when I thought I was done with the glazes, they pull me back. I want to do this black glaze on here now. Um, so that if I want to cover it up with the bridge, I can do that. Okay, that's super subtle and that's what I want.
this is what happens when you decide, ah, oh, I'm just gonna quickly do this. Does it ever work out? Still just gonna tweak this a little bit. You just have to be a bit more patient. Burning, burning toast. I don't know if I'm having a stroke or something. I love you, Lolly. Uh, you're very perceptive. 
And it's just a matter of slowing down. It's just sometimes, like, these, you know, doing a, a, a glaze on a big area like this is tricky. And um, ideally, I would break it down into smaller little bits and just get one area and then move to another and move to another. And then I just get into my head, well, I'll just do it real quick. Let's just, you know, because I was like, oh, I got this paint all mixed up. Got to use it. Let's do it. Boom. And then the painting goes, oh, really? Really? That's what you think you're going to do? Ah, oh, interesting. Ah, uh, okay. Well, we'll see how that works out, Michael. So, as I said, Paintings are always teaching me, at least, a bit about life. Okay, I'm going to move on from that. I'm just going to blow dry it so I don't get any paint in it. Well, he says, well, I just know those frustrated animal growls of pain. I hear them crying from my soul. When I paint so slow, I sympathize. Oh, I, when I paint, oh, I, I hear those crying. I hear those frustrated animal growls of pain. I hear them crying from my own soul when I paint, so I sympathize. Chill, it looks good. <laughs> okay, so let's, uh, let's move on from the howling animal pains to to a different type of pain <laughs> uh, let's look at the at the down here at the bottom of the bridge Ooh, I'm in for a doozy Just do here real quick. <laughs> quick. Um, it's just and get the shape of this bridge, and because it's everything's a little bit undefined currently.
let's move on. I think that's good enough for government work. Okay, so that there is Hiroshige's um, nameplate right here, his signature, just for reference. Maybe I'm going to do all these vertical lines first. I think that makes the most sense. And I am oops, just putting a bit of uh, glazing fluid in here. Mixing it up pretty well, uh, just to keep this paint wet. I know some people would prefer to use water or they don't have glazing fluid. Uh, this is a better alternative than water. Far superior, but you know, if you don't have glazing fluid, I get it. You gotta use whatever you got. But the, the reason glazing fluid is better is all sorts of reasons probably your the best reason is that if you make a mistake with it it takes a lot longer to dry so you can wipe it away versus uh, water is actually going to cause the paint to dry a little faster Okay, that's much easier to paint diagonally here than So assuming, you know, the, the paint is below is dry, if I do make a mistake here, I could just take my brush or, or cloth or anything and wipe some of that away. <clears throat> Which is a kind of a game changer if, you're, if you've never um, had that experience with acrylic paint. You know, acrylic paint, one of its great properties is that it dries so quickly. And that's what, you know, it's, makes it revolutionary over um, oil paint. But it's also one of the things that can drive people absolutely bonkers. Because if it takes, if it dries really quickly, then sometimes you're stuck with things. And then you got to paint over it or figure a way to deal with it so if you're using that uh, glazing fluid to help 
it sort of transforms your acrylic paint into oil paint. <clears throat> okay, so I want these getting lower. Notice that should be in a diagonal, hey? Hmm. So, the, you know, all of these pillars here are, you know, definitely make this scene very complex. I don't think, you know, trying to get it exactly correct is going to make a huge difference in this painting. I think as long as we see that there's a whole bunch of, like, unless, you know, like, no one's going to be looking at it, and, and unless you maybe got a, unless you're an engineer or something, no, I don't think that many people are going to be looking at it and, you know, fixating on all the problems that may or may not be there. It's sort of like leaves on a tree. As long as we sort of got the majority of them in there, I think we'll be fine.
<laughs> Kathy says, this one looks like an exercise in patience. And I think that's well said. Okay, so let's zoom back out. Let's zoom this out and just look at how poorly I did. <laughs> and, uh... Oh, goodness, okay. Okay, everything else is kind of clumped up, right? Okay. <laughs> now, where should we start here? What makes most sense to me? I feel like I want to start in the middle and then work my way outward. And that's about the angle, right? Should be parallel to the to these. one yeah. that was 
that I work in Markowski. What are we doing here? Oh, well, that one does have four posts, so I don't know. I don't know what's going on there. Maybe that's supposed to extend. <laughs> And then all these cross beams. So again, I feel like now the, the structure is fairly well established that uh, I can now just start putting these in.
Now, I could probably... Uh, the, uh, there's more in there, but you know what? I think that might be okay. Can I get away with that as it is? One, two... Okay, I think that's probably good enough for that. And there's Lisa M. This says, looks good. Really like how you painted the blue background houses area. Awesome. Thanks, Lisa. Good to see you in the chat. Use the sniffle there. Okay, getting getting there. Let's now put the the um, railings in here so our people don't fall off. So let's blow dry this so I don't smudge anything. Okay, the reason why that blow drying took so long is that um, some there was a little few tacky areas, in, and because I used my glazing fluid, excuse me, I used my glazing fluid in that gray paint in order to thin it down a little bit so that I could um, make it a little bit more fluid-like and easier to paint with. Now I was going to do the railings next, but because this, there's still a little bit tacky. 
I'm just going to let that uh, settle for another little bit here. I'm going to just paint um, the... Well, yeah, well, let's let's paint the sign at the top. The, the the title of the painting so I'm taking some white and cool yellow it's a little intense Just a little bit of gray. There we go. Just to give it. Just so it's not too. I can always brighten it, but I think that's. Maybe that is too dark, but let's see. It is brighter. Okay. Well, let's let's brighten it then. Now, that's probably the same color as the hats of the figures in the cloak, but I'm going to paint that later. It's not too hard of a color to mix again, so I'm not worried about that. But I would bet <clears throat> that that was probably in the same block, uh, color block. There would have been that little square and just these little split. I mean, you should, if you're interested in, in like, there are some great videos. I think I, there's there. Yeah, I think I included a playlist of this guy doing a um, a traditional Japanese yukiyoi um, uh, woodblock print, like from the beginning, drawing it to putting it onto paper to applying that onto the block, gluing it onto the block, and then carving it out, and then. Um, and, and then inking it, printing it, and then doing the color. I mean, it's like, I think it's like a 15 episode series, right? It just keeps going on and on. And just for one block, you know, it, that's, I mean, you could see also why you would have kind of an assembly line because there's just so many steps and it takes so much time that if it took one, per, one person doing it, it could take them like a year to do just one print, right? And it kind of defeats the purpose if you're just doing one, you know, then, because uh, part of, one of the reasons people like to do prints is that they can make lots of prints from it. Now, one of the great things with Hiroshige is he made, well, probably, well, this, with this one, you know, there was, there's somewhere between, what did they say? Like, f well, it's debatable, but somewhere between five to 8,000, and that, that's probably on the low end. And, and that actually is is a, a very low print, so it's it's more likely there are probably like tens of thousands of these that went out, um, but not everyone saved them. That's the thing. You're like, wow, there's so many of them. You know, it's like baseball cards. Yeah, well, they might have made tens of thousands of Babe Ruth cards and put them into cigarette packs, 
But a lot of people are like, oh, that's cool, threw it out and into the garbage. Now, of course, they're worth, you know, you know tens of millions of dollars because not, not very many people just thought to save them. <laughs> okay. That feels a little bit better. So let's do the railing now. That's kind of like a... Maybe I can even use this color. Probably need to mix more of it, but uh, let's let's do it properly. There's no reason to just use the the remnants here when I still got plenty of stuff to do. So we'll take our gosh, it's very close. To, well, yeah. that. Do I have any white left on here? I'm gonna make it a little bit more intense. This way, maybe I don't have to outline it with black, or at least so much of it. So the original is a little bit more faded color than this, but it benefits from having the um, black outline so we can we can be pretty subtle in that sense but here I would love to be able to just use this color on its own for the railing and then move on He says, I, I love the blue teal green water effect. Thank you. Well, we'll see how that holds up. Again, here's that's the, that was the Hiroshige. Here's the Van Gogh version. Um, you can see his is even more green. And he really, he, unlike Hiroshige and myself, he made a decision to like put like the waves in here, like to try to delineate the, the different parts of the water. He also spent some time adding a few different colors and shadows and things down there. Um, very interesting. It's, I think it's just fascinating to see how an artist approaches these different works. Where's the Met? Okay. That, by the way, is where the, the two people on the left are going to be. And this is where the sign the red bar where uh, Hiroshige's signature will eventually land. <laughs> okay. Maybe I'm going to go even smaller brush.
I mean, painting this is is tricky. But carving this and these little lines. That's why I say, like, it's a shame that the person who did the actual printing of this is not remembered, or at least I wasn't able to find any information about them, because I think they are just as much of, uh, certainly as important in this process as Hiroshige was, um, and certainly an absolutely incredible craftsperson. I'm not on screen while I'm doing this. Oops. I'm only going to do five more of these. <laughs> oh my goodness. The lines are getting close together. Yeah, there's no way I'm going to be outlining these little lines. Are you kidding me? Forgetting to
add these lines over here to get uh, so close together that it makes and the other side of the bridge should, in theory, be, have a railing that is smaller, and therefore the rails closer together than this one. But don't really see how that's going to happen. So obviously you see a little bit of that water overlapping. I'll try to fix that. I still have a little bit of my original paint from my first layer after my imprimatura left. So I'm gonna use that to tidy this up afterwards. So now that I've got that in, okay. Once again, I'm just going to show you, I just put a couple drops of glazing fluid in there. I'm going to stir it up really well, otherwise I'm going to have a very thin layer. My goal is not to make a transparent layer, it's just to give a little bit more fluidity back to that paint. So This is again like what somebody might do if they were using, you know, what I think people want to do when they're using water, but um, here I'm actually just adding the binding mechanism back into the paint so I won't have kind of like a semi-transparent paint that I'm not happy with.
So I just decided to do the outer top rail first for, I don't know, whatever reason. You know, perhaps in retrospect, I should have started with this side of the railing first and seen how wide my lines would be before starting with the the other side because now I'm kind of stuck with not a big deal. It's just something to, you know, it's one of those things, just a learning experience and Every painting is a learning experience, and I hope everybody learns from my experiences. <laughs> because knowing how wide I did these, then I could be like, okay, well, I'm just going to make the other side even wider. So there's going to be a little bit of a discrepancy now between these different sides, but... Hey, you know, it's okay. It's like uh, Kim Mitchell, another Canadian rocker, used to say, might as well go for a soda. Nobody... Nobody gets hurt and nobody dies. <laughs> so I'm just going to come back onto this side here. Whoa. And I'm just going to widen. Didn't mean to do it so wide, but uh, I guess I am. I'm just going to widen the top railing. Just so it looks like I have some brains. I'm not a complete fool, but uh, I'll leave that to everybody else to decide. Those ones over there. Are definitely harder to see. It almost makes me want to... You know, these ones work well because they're over top of that dark uh, area on the bridge. But these ones over there kind of get lost a little bit. Hmm... I mean, one thing that Van Gogh did do is he darkened 
the sides of the rails and let the top one stay lighter. I'm just gonna keep going forward here and you know, we'll, we'll sort out the problems as they arise. Okay. So we've got Paul says, I'm, Paul says, I'm using the acrylic paint marker for the bridge fences. Not bad. <laughs> well, he says, I still believe once this painting is complete, you will have earned yourself an engineering degree, or at least I think you should. Yeah, as, Paul, as uh, Lolly says there, to carve this is just... Talk about intricate detail. Ooh, too much. Makes my head hurt just thinking about it. Speaking of engineering, I have these supporting slats here in the bridge. I think I'm, mine are a little bit closer together than they need to be, but... I'm just erring on the side of safety. You know, I don't want this bridge to collapse. You know, you get a bunch of rowdy teenagers here. Yanking and jumping on the bridge. Horsing around, the railing collapses. <laughs> it is nice, though, you know, all of a sudden you put those little lines there and the bridge kind of snaps into view a little bit, right?
<laughs> uh, Lolly says, that's right, Michael. Safety first. Things have changed since the original was painted. Bridges need more stability now. Uh, okay, that feels good. Now, you know, things slowly coming together. It would be nice if they came together, you know, been sort of five hours ago. <laughs> I mean, I guess I talked for the first hour and a half, but still. We're doing, I mean, as, as crazy as it sounds, we're doing pretty well. I mean, I would say I'm probably 60% done right now, which is, you know, uh, still a ways to go. Because it's like, do I, what do I do here? Do I, how much of these, the bridge do I want to define? Do I really want to outline that whole thing? Still got some paint trapped in here. Well, I appreciate your support. Thank you, Lolly, for those kind comments. I mean, really, what I've got left are a few lines on the bridge, a couple, like, you know, and I guess these ones. The people defining the bottom of the bridge, and then the, the lines for the, the rain. And that's, that's the, the kicker there. How we want to approach that is, um, I'm probably gonna do use my Posca pen for that um, and because that's just gonna save a ton of time if I try to use my paintbrush to do it, it's gonna drive me bonkers so we'll probably use the Posca pen um,
the one thing is is it's going to make it's going to radically change this painting and I, I might be very happy therefore that this that my colors are a little bit more saturated because once I start putting black lines on the top, this whole painting is going to darken by about 60%. And then I might I might be very grateful that this is as bright as it is because it's going to... It, it won't look as dark as it would had I not done that. So we'll see. Um, I guess I could have used that same color. I'm gonna use a version of that color for this little raft back there. Let's take this same color, but uh, let's make it put a bit of more white in it. Hmm, that's, that's, hmm, brighter than I was planning. That should be a brown, a darker brown, now that I see it. Hmm. Huh. Well, let's leave it. I got plenty of other stuff to do. And then maybe I'll forget it. Hokusai, not Hokusai, Hiroshige's name goes.
So I added a little bit of white in here to because I need to cover up a bunch of these lines. In fact, I should probably I could have just painted white here first, but I think I'm going to need is all the room I can get, so I'm going to go maybe a, even a little bit higher than the master himself needed to write his own name. <laughs> In the past, I've just taken these right out or just haven't painted them, but... I guess my fear has always been, what if I write these, in this case, Japanese characters incorrectly and it says something horribly offensive or makes me look like an idiot, but I think I do a pretty good job making myself look like an idiot uh, without this anyway, so I'm already doing pretty good job of that so can't see myself making it any worse <laughs> oh just like putting my big head in front of the camera So again, the reason why I added making this a pink is that it's going to make it a lot easier to paint red over top of that than if I just tried to paint uh, the red right there. The red is fairly transparent, so that would have just been a super uh, frustrating. So. And in order to keep things consistent, even though I don't have too much of an overlap up top here, I'm just going to paint this. I kind of like that pink. I, I mean, if we zoom out, it's not the right color, obviously, but it, I don't mind that either. There is something about that red that's really intense. There's something kind of nice about those pastels. They're kind of soft.
<laughs> Lolly says, I've been up all night watching work take place on this bridge. It's 5 a.m. LOL, I'm sure I'll regret it tomorrow, but hey, I blame Michael. <laughs> you shouldn't make the stream so entertaining. Well, I I mean, that is, that's a subjective comment there. I don't know how entertaining all of this is, but uh, I do appreciate the... The very generous, generous compliment. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of, I like that pink. Maybe I, well, I need to let it dry anyway, so maybe I'm just going to sit on it and see if it, uh, if I, how I feel. Um. And I think you should go to bed, Lolly. <laughs> uh, my chats keep deleting. I, I don't know. I haven't done anything on my end, and I don't think there's anything happening. So it could just be a little glitch on YouTube or something. <laughs> We're slowly getting closer and closer. Okay, this little fellow here. What color is that? Kind of, I'm going to paint him like the bridge color. Okay, are we ready to start putting some legs and things all over this bridge? <laughs> um, okay, so there's our, that's, um, I gotta make this a little bit distinct of a color from the bridge. So I wanna make it a bit more, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit more rosy than this and the railing <coughs> Goodness, Lolly, you're gonna stick out to the end. Oof, I, it could be a couple more hours. I mean, just to give a heads up, the sun's gonna be up before this painting's done. <laughs> um, I appreciate the the offer or the suggestion or the willingness, but uh, um, you're in for a, a ride here. And Sanders says, I've been painting vicariously through Michael. Um, LOL, I've uh, been doing computer errands all night. <laughs> you guys are awesome. What an incredible group community. I'm just, pff, uh, when I think about it, it almost brings me to tears. I just like, this is crazy. I don't know how. I'm super, super fortunate. So I appreciate that. Um, okay. Let's go in and look at these bare legs. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that this painting, um, if I didn't mention already, is it's a, it's intended to describe this sudden rainstorm on a summer afternoon. And one of the reasons we know it's summer and not in the middle of winter is the way that these people are dressed. So you can see that 
had this been the middle of, you know, winter or fall, right, people probably would not be walking around in, you know, very skimpy clothes. These are men, by the way, and these are two women. So, um, uh, obviously there's a different clothing um, for the, the different climates, right? Let's make sure we're in focus here. Okay, you can still see a little bit of this guy's legs here. figures here all kind of colliding together. That's kind of awkward. So yeah, I'm just painting them as kind of little stick figuries. So you know, if, if as you're working on this, these figures, and you you really do a catastrophic goof on one of them, well, no problem. You can always just cover them with rain, right? So on camera, that looks they they um, look a little bit more brown and beige than they actually are in person. These, if anything, I was like, oh, it looks a little bit more peachy than maybe I would like. But um, there's definitely a contrast between these legs and the um, uh, the railing, whereas. At least uh, on camera, as it appears to me, they look much closer to the same, but they are distinctly different for sure. And you know what? I, I mean, I kind of I think I'm just going to... I like how he's painted these as a little bit more triangular feet. Maybe that's a little, a little much. I don't know. Okay. Let's go to the other side here. We got these, the women with their white stockings.
I do feel really bad for the, the guy, this guy over on the end there who clearly left the house without an umbrella <laughs> and finds himself just, I think he's cowering under like a, you know, um, a rug or, a, you know, a newspaper or something. <laughs> and anyone who's been to Vancouver has probably knows what that experience is like, where you're like, ah, that looks okay. I think we'll, I'll be fine today. And then just by the time you get just far enough away from home, too far to turn back, that's when the rain starts coming down. The heavens open up and it just, you know, it, the, the, it rains. Yeah, Kathy says, who's the guy in the diaper? <laughs> That's Michael. <laughs> He's rolling up his sleeves. <laughs> well, without an umbrella and without pants, that's a bad day. Yeah, that's... So many great comments. Uh, Sandra says, um, I love the little shoes the women are wearing. They're called geta in Japanese, I think. That's cool. I, there's a couple of my students at Emily Carr, the university I teach at, uh, this past semester came to school in, in shoes just like that. And I was just like, wow. I mean, they're not the most practical shoes, <laughs> but I was like, it's, it's like it's time for those to make a comeback. And why aren't there... Why doesn't Nike make a pair of those things? You know, like they're wood with kind of a two little blocks on the front and back. You know, probably not the kind of thing you want to run around in, but um, yeah, it's, you know, it's one of those things you just like, hmm. You know, I've, I've, obviously it's not the first time I've seen them, but I haven't really seen anybody walking around in them before, so. It's just one of those things. Okay. There's a few little places now that I look. I see a bit of green. to put that one little bit of green. I mean, I guess there's a tiny bit of green in that guy's shirt over there. Uh, I guess let's put a bit of that there. Then. Obviously, I'm simplifying things. <clears throat> well, let's take a little bit of blue and white.
Let's go back to our gray from earlier. I'm just gonna use the same bridge pylon gray. Bridge pile gray, I mean. I almost feel like maybe I need to make that a little bit darker. Okay. That guy, there's, why is he rolling up his sleeves? Is he chasing those women or something? What's going on with that guy? There's a little, a little menacing in that little figure. Okay, let's go back to, let's get some yellow. Thank you. 
these characters here. So I have to come back and do just a little bit more on top of these. So I need to cover up a bit more of that paint. So I need a second coat. Well, he says, uh, I'm going to go pretend to be asleep for a little bit. I'll still be listening, though, and possibly peeking up just to check on the progress. Just closing my eyes for a second. Night, all. Thanks for a great stream. You should go to bed, Lolly. Don't worry about watching. The video will be here for eternity to when you wake up. So get some good, good Z's in there. Have a great sleep. Thanks for tuning in and keeping me company this whole time. That's cool. Sandra, I love all the stuff you just posted there about uh, these shoes. Just looked it up on Wikipedia. Sometimes get to are worn in rain to keep the feet dry due to the extra height and impermeability compared to other footwear such as Zori. They make a similar noise to flip-flops, slapping against the heel when walking through the inflexibility of get to means, unlike flip-flops, water and dirt are not flipped up onto the back of the legs. That's so cool. <laughs> Seems like the Gen Z students are already on it. Yeah, totally. I mean, I just think that that's... It makes me happy because I just think... You know, just over the decade or so that I've been at the university... Um, just seeing like young Asian kids really embracing their culture and uh, wearing it, you know, wearing traditional fashion with pride. That makes me super happy because, you know, I think there's a pressure to, to conform and, and dress in the, in the, according to the, you know, dominant white style to fit in, you know, especially, you know, a lot of my students are like 19, 20 years old, so when you start seeing students kind of really embrace their culture, it's like, oh, that's ex so exciting, because obviously, obviously I think there's a lot of, you know, this is Japanese culture, Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, Philippines. I mean, I guess maybe is that South Asian um, cultures are super rich. 
Um, I just think about myself when, when I was a kid, you know, Ukrainian culture wasn't like the coolest culture to, <laughs> to, to, um, you know, all my, most of my friends were very white, you know, and, um, so I also myself sort of went out of my way to, you know, maybe not show that side of myself. So I just, I, I don't know, I just think that that's really cool. It makes me happy to see. Um, gives me hope for the new generation, right? Okay, now, getting to the... Getting to the um, the the closer and closer to the point of reckoning here with rain and black. I mean, I love how that that feel. Really happy with the way this looks as it is. So there is that little bit of like, oh, we're gonna start putting lines over top of all this work. Lines that, once they're there, are there, can't be removed. Hmm. I almost want to keep those pink. Now, I don't have to decide now. I could do all of the line work with, um, and then paint that later. There's that patterning up there. Hmm, okay. There's always more, isn't there? Always just a little bit more. orange left anywhere?
that is, woof. I mean, yeah, that's strange. I wonder what he was thinking while he's working on that. Sanders says, no, Michael, you got to match the side thing with the color and the wavy part because it was probably one ink color. You're right. I mean, like, this should also be red. <sighs> yeah. It does look... It, kind of, it looked better when it was just a, a yellow square. You're, you're right. Um, so... Uh, I'll follow your advice. But, you know, that's how painting goes. You know, sometimes you... Something can look really great for a while, and then it no longer works. And then you just gotta... Um, roll with it. Like that's that red just like boom. That is bold. Especially compared to most of the other colors thus far are kind of more muted. Well, I guess at least in the original. Mine I always tend to have pretty bright colors anyway, but
<laughs> Sandra says, I thought the pink looked good too until the shorts and wavy thing came in the picture. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and especially, I, I, I think I'm gonna put the, the Japanese characters over top of all this. Oops. Um. So I think it would look kind of strange if I might be on pink. And then also, you know, there's probably. Potentially, anyway, some, you know, a, a, a connotation to having the red there that, you know, I might be probably culturally ignorant about. I mean, I was probably going to do it anyway, but, you know, sometimes, I think, you know, this is sometimes as an artist, you're just like, hmm, can I just leave it like that? Do I really have to do more, do the whole thing, do more work? Can we not, can we just leave it and say it just looks better that way? That does look kind of nice. That's, that is kind of cool. Okay. So... Pascaline says, you teach me patience, Michael. <laughs> I, well, I mean, I think doing this is definitely good for, for me patience-wise. It t teaches myself patience. Um, there's something about doing this and not, you know, if I'm doing it live, I feel somewhat accountable. And I have to kind of like, okay, people are watching you. <laughs> you gotta keep your... Uh, uh, mind your your manners and your and your language. got everything except some black lines to do um, in a few different places so this is sort of like the um, we you know we've got I mean I really like the way this painting looks at this point and now we're going to dramatically change it which is you know one of those things if you after you've been working for five hours on the same image and then the idea of Doing something radical on top of it is a little bit scary, but um, it's also like, you know, it, as scary as it is, it's, first of all, I don't think we were going to ruin it. And even if the worst thing that we did quote unquote ruin it, well, you know, it took me about five hours to get to this point and that's not it's not like my time isn't valuable but I, I wouldn't consider it to be a wasted um, experience I could say like well I learned a lesson there that maybe 
maybe I didn't need to do that. Maybe I could do it again, and I probably would do it faster as well. There was a lot of little fiddling around here in this one. The one thing that I don't like about using Posca pans is I find that they, they, they take time to dry. And I find even after they've been quote unquote dried, they seem to still be a little wet. They can smudge. So that's my own, my only anxiety about this is I do wonder, should I, um, like if this, if I, if I do use the Posca pen down here and then I got the ruler going over top of all of that, there is potential that I could smudge some stuff. And once I start smudging with the Posca pen, it would be a real nightmare. So, and then the other thing is, do I want to use black Posca pen for the rain or potentially gray for the rain? Now, obviously, um, Hiroshige used black, but he's... That's a really thin lines. Um, whereas I can try to go really thin with this, but I don't know how thin I can actually get. So there's going to be a bunch of... Um, this is going to be a learning experience, to say the least. So it's... Yeah, it's not going to get easier if the more and more and just diddle-daddle. So let's... Um, Let's do the figures first. Right, should I, do I want to outline all these figures? In fact, let's just make sure this is ready to go. make sure this tip is nice and clean. Well, there you go. Here I was talking about how it's easily it smudges and then I just drew that line and it's... I, I do suppose it's the, the paper is going to absorb that ink or the paint, I should say, much better and more quickly than canvas will. It's more likely just to sit on the surface rather than be absorbed by the fiber of the paper. Um, I think that there's a few lines on here that I'm going to start out with first. I can move my palette out of the way for a bit here.
obviously you want your Posca pen to be, or the, 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 the acrylic underneath to be as dry as possible. Otherwise you'll ruin your Posca pen by painting into wet paint. <laughs> this poor guy just cracks me up. Oh my goodness. It is, it's hilarious to think, you know, as much as um, time has changed over the past 150 years or more, some things just stay the same. Getting caught in that summer rain when you're Without an umbrella and without pants. <laughs> How many times does that happen to all of us? <laughs> uh, so I just want to show you how this looks now. Like, you can see, whoa, big difference, right? Um, all of a sudden, doing a little bit of outlining brings those figures into sharp, sharp focus. So whereas before they were just, they were pretty loose and abstract, now they're really, you know, well-defined. It does, you know, make me feel like, ah, maybe do I need to do the whole bridge and outline all of that? Like, oh my goodness. Um, and maybe I do, but um, let's just see. Well, let's... Try for now. Don't want to push my luck, but uh, I'm gonna outline. feeling I'm going to be outlining this whole thing. It's not going to take forever. It's just, you know. I mean, yeah, again, that makes a huge difference, doesn't it? Okay, let's...
Um, Sandra asks, what, uh, what size of Posca pen is this? This is the 0 0.7 millimeter Posca pen. Um, and I wonder if adding a layer of clear matte medium might help before the Posca pen. That, uh, you know, that's a good suggestion. That could work. Yeah. Um. It would probably help create a very smooth surface because there is a bit of texture here. And that texture can be a little frustrating to overcome.
Oops. I don't know, I'm just sort of losing the plot a bit here. Uh, we'll put an extra pile here, because I'm not sure what just happened. Oops. So there's a little bit of weirdness going on down there, but I kind of think there's a bit of weirdness in his as well. So that's okay. Maybe there's maybe there's a logic here that uh, it makes some sense to somebody on some planet. And that's all that matters. I'm just gonna come back here.
through a stick a little bit long, but whatever. Okay, let's now zoom back out. So there's still a few things on the bridge. We got um, this line going across. I think I'm just going to quickly do that with a pencil just to be a little bit uh, prudent here. Got these these strips, which are not just straight across. It looks like they are also following the same diagonal pattern as here. So I want to try to keep that. In fact, again, it's worth just Okay. Uh, I'm going to blow dry all of this here. Just, just try to get this as bone dry as possible.
Okay. Kind of wish I didn't do the transfer onto the paper because it's made these lines kind of uh, illegible. sign it right now or do I want to wait till the end maybe let's put the title in place That comes out pretty wide and thick, hey? Doesn't really look like fine Japanese calligraphy there, so that's a bit disappointing, but. I guess I can see it, right? I guess it doesn't need to be on camera. Ooh, even smaller here, okay.
I love this wild line here. Um, Sandra says, I wonder what these actually say in the red in Japanese. Um, in the, the red area, let's, let's just, uh, talk it specific here. Um, as far as I understand, the red here should say, um, Roughly translated into English, 100 Famous Views of Edo. That's the title of the series. And then in the yellow box here, this should say... And I've seen various different translations of this. So I've heard of like evening rain or... But the, off the most common translation is sudden shower over Shin... Ohashi Bridge and Atake. And so this is Shin Oshashi Bridge and Atake is the uh, the area on the other side of the river there. And this is a river flowing right through uh, Edo or Edo, I mean, um, which is now known as Tokyo. Um, I don't, I wonder how that was done though, because that, I mean, I mean, maybe that was, in fact, let's just, I just want to see what, uh, how does the one, oh, well, let's see. How is that, how is that possible that that's, that that was done as a, a you know, a wood block? <laughs> to do, like, that's crazy to me that someone carved that out of a wood a signature like that that looks like I mean uh, let, I gotta check that again okay so this is because if they are close to identical that really does mean it's made out of a block that looks identical that is one block of wood that is crazy uh, I'll reserve his signature until the very end until we get this done um, so I'm just going to blow dry that again. Did I do this already? I can't.
<laughs> Thanks, Sandra. Um, well, yeah, Sandra says maybe he hand signed them, but they 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 look, you know, the, the that especially the title. I mean, it's identical. I mean, it's possible. That obviously, you know, um, in J Japan, like calligraphy is is an art form, and so people would practice you know, meticulously how to to um, to to write with the idea of being able to do it perfectly each and every time. So it is it's possible. That each one of them is hand signed, but even, but it looks, you know, it's so well integrated into that composition that it doesn't, it doesn't look like it's been hand signed. It looks like it's part of it. It's just, I mean, that more than anything in this image makes it look is convinces me that it's, uh, um, Done hand carved. I do want to get. Hmm. Okay. One of the features, as you can see on camera here, is that there's there's two sets of lines. We have these black ones and then gray ones in diagonal. So I think I'm going to try to do that as well because I don't have enough stuff to do <laughs> and worry about. <clears throat> now let's just see, do those gray lines go all the way down? They do. I was going to suggest maybe they stop halfway. And what angle are we talking about? The black ones. How am I going to? do this so. Doesn't have to be perfect, but if it's close, that's better, right? Gosh, that's pretty darn close. <laughs> that can't be. Did I? How did I get that? So my brain atrophying minute by minute here. That's pretty close. Okay. So that's the first set of lines. And the other ones... I should, the, it makes sense for the black ones to be over top of the gray ones, of course. Oh, I just like how this looks so much. I kind of just want to leave it. <laughs> uh, but uh, we must soldier on here. So how much of an angle? Let's... Uh, Let's 
let's measure this. I think this makes logical sense to do something like this. Because what's important is just get those first few lines in place and then and then we see. Okay, let's uh, Right, does that... I don't know how I would compare these two. I don't think my brain is big enough to make that... Uh, to figure it out, so I think it's just a matter of just doing it. Now, oh, this is a 0.07. I was going to say, ah, I've got a big one at 0 0.07. What is the difference? Pin type and bullet shaped. Because this gray seems to be doing quite similar thin lines. So let's, uh, are we ready? We're ready for this? Just trying to delay as long as possible before I commit myself to this. Because once you've got it, I'm just want to. Can I? You don't mind if I just take a quick picture? This is probably gonna jinx myself, but. We'll always have this photograph, Michael.
so far so good. Paint, I think paint black back over top of that anyway. That's working. Just a little bit worried about in between here. I think I just want another strip of tape. I should have done this before, but Not quite perfect, but I think good enough. And probably just moving this is going to throw things out of whack a bit anyway, so. Ay, ay, ay.
Sandra says, looks cool with the gray. Nice job. Thanks, Sandra. I mean, it's interesting because from different angles, it's, you know, it's more or less visible, so, um, which is, I, I like, actually, so. Now, obviously, he did more than that. Do I want to do more than that? That's the question. cool okay I think that's probably good enough for the gray I feel like I could put a ton more on there but I don't know if it's gonna improve anything um, okay so I think I can take my these blue lines off now I don't know why I'm saving it. I feel like it's the pack rat in me. He's like, maybe I'll be able to reuse this tape sometime. That's not right. That's better. Okay, I want to blow dry that again.
sorry, just uh, the nanny texting here. Okay. Continuing right along with our most bold decision yet. Where should we go? Should we just go right down the middle? What did I learn any lessons last time that I can apply to this one? Um What is easier to do? It's easier to work right to left. I'm just going to keep on going, not even going to think about it. Sure, this is just riveting content here. <laughs> Guy draws lines for 45 minutes.
Okay, I want to blow dry it and put a few more lines halfway in the middle. It's a pretty dark line. I think someone's going to have to wrestle this thing away from me. I think that might be okay. Excuse me. Okay. Okay, so almost done. I just want to do a couple little things. I want to I want to go back with a little bit of a glaze on the top and the bottom just to incorporate some of the these raindrop lines. And then uh, I want to put the signature on. So I think I'm getting very close. Hopefully. Uh, I just need a bit of... Don't tell me I have to make another black to do this. I guess I... Do I... So do I need to do this if I have to make another black? I don't know. our 
blue, yellow, warm red. What am I doing? Using your finger, Markowski. Right at the end of the painting. You're really just pushing your luck, aren't you? Tell my brain is shutting down here.
This whole time it's been muted. There we go. Okay, let's mute. Before I go to that, I'm just gonna. This is. This just gives you an idea of what I do after almost every one of these shows. I use this spray. Careful not to spray it all over the place because I don't want it to get on top of the artwork. I don't know. I, this is this is what I usually do at the end of every episode. So it's nasty stuff. It's got a, quite the smell. But it you can see how it instantly helps get acrylic paint off of basically any surface. I use this sometimes at school if we make a big mess. You have to be careful. Some floors, it will literally take the polish off the floor. So, and then I just take a rag, wipe it away. I don't think I've, this, I've ever filmed this before. And then I just run this under the sink to clean it off. So, now let's do our side-by-side -side comparison. So, uh, before we do so, just as a reminder to hit the like button, subscribe button, the notification bell so you know when future episodes are coming up. Uh, take a photograph of the painting that you made. Upload it to our Facebook group. Let's just see this. Just showing you this and where it is. Um, it grows, you know, 20 people a week. Awesome, super supportive group for people probably just like yourself at various different stages of your art journey. Uh, once a month, I go through everything that's on here. I give free feedback to people like yourself, whether you're you're doing the drawing course that I did three years ago, or painting, what we did in class, or something else. It's free. Why not, right? Um, and if you want to support the channel with a small donation, consider leaving a dollar through PayPal. You can send an e-transfer via my email, which is on my website and the Facebook group. The links to the Facebook group and my website are down below. Um, or maybe above, I don't know if you're uh, standing on your head. And uh, anyway, ah, Easy Arts 47 says, hi, hello. So let's uh, take a look how this painting turned out. There's the original by the master himself, Hiroshige. And there's my version. And... Not too shabby. Definitely took some time to get here, but we got there. And I like how it turned out. Um, you know, it was a, it's a little bit scary putting those lines, the gray lines, and then the black lines over top. But it really does make a huge difference. You know, it, it, uh, you know it's, it's, it's different. Right? It, there was a stage a little while ago where before I put those lines on, I really liked how it looked. But it wasn't the original painting, right? It was a different different painting. And here we've done that, and it captures the intensity of that moment, of that sudden rain happening on a warm summer afternoon. I think we've all been there running around just like this guy without his umbrella. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I feel like, you know, again, remember I was saying I was, I 
I made this, some of these colors are more saturated, which is not unusual. They tend to be the way that I use color, a little bit more saturated anyway. Um, but I think it worked out well, because once we start getting all these darker lines on there, the painting does get much darker very quickly. So I think had I maybe, maybe tried to originally match the color on the left, that would have been much darker. So I'm happy with the way that turned out. You know, the, the far shore, the buildings on the far shore become much more obscured once we have the rain coming down over top of it. So, you know, just an hour ago, this was much more well-defined. And now it's um, like uh, almost, you know, it's very abstract now. We can't really tell that those are necessarily buildings. Um... Okay, so let's zoom in. Where should we go? Let's. Uh... Let's start maybe down the bottom left here. Okay. Um. Yeah, I think that turned out pretty good. I mean, these all these figures are they're pretty, you know, I mean, there's there's first of all they're very small, so getting all that detail, I mean, like you can see that's my finger. So it's, you know, what are we talking? Less than an inch there, right? So it's hard to get a lot of detail in there. Not that great of an excuse cuz Hokus or not Hokus say Hiroshige um, did this with a wood block, although he probably didn't do the carving himself, but uh, it's still remarkable that the amount of detail that they're able to get, uh, so I don't really have an excuse. <laughs> you could do it with a with a, a little chisel and, and tools and stuff, then you could certainly do it with a paintbrush, but uh, I used the Posca pen to do all that stuff. I think that turned out okay. I'm also fairly happy with the signature. I think I did a reasonable job. Maybe let's continue down here on the bottom. Uh, you know, maybe in retrospect, I, I, I wish maybe I had taken my black lines and just gone all the way down through to the bottom. And maybe not stopping down there as I did. Uh, you know, it's something I didn't really think about until I saw it. I see it now, but same thing with those gray lines. These gray lines on top of this bridge. How come I thought I... No, there are some there. There just maybe not as many of them up front. Uh, but that's okay. It's, again, maybe you know from different in different lighting, you could see they sort of kind of disappear. So you know, right now on camera, those diagonal gray lines seem very prominent. But from my angle where I'm standing right now, they they're almost invisible. So, but I like that again. That almost makes the painting more dynamic when it literally changes depending on the angle you're looking at. Uh, you know, remember when I was doing all of these columns or the pill, the the piles for this bridge? You know, it, it got a little bit messy, and maybe some of these it doesn't quite make a lot of sense in a few places. But once we start getting all the lines from the the rain on top of it. You know, it's uh, it becomes not particularly important, or it's you know they kind of just blur together. How about these figures? The figures on here. Let's scroll over here. Um, you know, I think they actually turn out well. I I, I actually now having you know, spent some time with Hiroshige. I actually really quite like the way the, these sort of triangular feet. It's different than the way that I normally, that I, I would have done them more as like L-shaped had I not seen this great artist and kind of followed in their footsteps a little bit. And that might be something I incorporate going forward just in my own art because I, um, I like how that looks. I think it's it, it looks less cartoony than I think it it would have otherwise. Um. <laughs> he 
shouldn't. I still just can't find that so funny. That poor guy with the, I don't know, newspaper or blanket or rug or whatever he's carrying over top of his head to keep himself dry. And then we got the, the three friends huddled under one umbrella. This guy who's charging down the path, down the bridge, rolling up his sleeves. He looks like he's, he, he is not happy. And he's kind of approaching these two women here um, who are carefully walking on their gaita shoes. I think is that um, what Sander said? Um, so he's probably barefoot or maybe in flip-flops and he's making good time. I don't know. I've, I'm a little worried for these poor girls or women there. Um, but, uh, you know, I tried to kind of make it look like the wind is kind of blown. Well, that doesn't make sense. How's the wind? You'd think the wind would be coming this way to create those diagonal lines, but maybe the wind is... I don't know, now it, I thought the wind, I guess when I was drawing them, I kind of figured the wind is coming this way, pushing their dresses up against their body and the, their, uh, but you know, maybe the wind is coming from all different directions, or maybe it's not that windy at all, I don't, I don't know. Um, let's look at the, the man on the raft back there. slightly different angle and he's a little bit more forward on mine than um, and I'm not really sure which direction he's going in is he pushing himself forward or pushing him maybe he must be pushing away so he's probably going towards the bridge right that makes sense I think okay let's look at the top left here now Obviously, these colors are got a little bit more uh, bluish, purpley quality there. And you know, as we talked about, this is you know not This is one of the later prints. If we look just briefly at again at the museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Arts version. Oops. We see those three houses, or boat houses there. So I tried to bring those back in and get some more detail because the version that I was working from um, is, is, you know, these buildings are totally, undef I mean, almost completely invisible, really, right? Um, let's just scroll a little bit over here just to look a little bit on the other side. So you can see that's what my version looks like there. It's almost, that's interesting. Okay, let's keep an eye on this building here. When we look at the one at the, from the Met, oh, that building, does it not seem higher, taller? Let's, let's just check. Oh, well, maybe they're the same. I guess maybe they're the same. Uh, the other thing, too, is we, in the, the version, uh, the print at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, we see the two other little boats there. Um, in the version that I'm working from here, uh, there's no boats. So that's, you know, a difference in the, than these two different prints. I just decided to, I kind of liked the color of the Mets uh, version, but I decided not to do the, the men in the boats back there. It is pretty cool though. I, I mean, that's one of the kind of the neat things with printmaking is, is sometimes is there's often those little differences. And then let's go up here to the, uh, again, the, this is the series. These. This is the um, 100 views of Edo, of Edo. I have a, one of my best friends is is Edo, <laughs> so I always get mixed up. Um, 
And so that's the, the title of the series that Hiroshige was creating. And then this is the title of the, of the artwork itself, the sudden shower over Shin Ohashi Bridge and Atake. Uh, you know, I kind of amplified the size of that. I don't know if it's a shrine or in the background. I maybe didn't do the best job of it. Again, it looks a little different there than it does in the Mets version. It's as you can see, it's you can it's articulated a little bit more versus this one. It sort of just turned into a blob. Um, okay. What do you think? Can we go celebrate now? Look at that. It's approaching eight hours since we began. I did talk for about an hour and this changed, but uh, we got there. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for painting along with me. I can't wait to see what you created, whether you... you tried your best to do a version of Hiroshige's art or anybody else's or something from your own imagination, I would love to see it. And I know our community would love to see it. So join the Facebook group. Let's see what you're up to. Let's get, let's build each other up. The more and more people that are making art in the, uh, the better of a world, the more peaceful of a world we're going to have. Um, and I sincerely appreciate the time that you spent watching today. Uh, we'll see you guys next week, I think. Um, and until then, have a great night or morning. Some of you are probably just waking up right now and realizing I'm still <laughs> online. But I'm done. Have a great night, everybody. We'll see you again very soon.